Oh, I did nothing. I did nothing. Nice. Wake the beast, everybody. Hey. Hey, they're going wild for you, beast. They're going wild for you. Am I in outer space with you, friend? You are. You are. We're in space. We're in the space matrix. We have made yes, it. Yes, and how cool it is to be psychedelic today. <laughs> I would say so. I mean, this the, the 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 times we live in seem a bit psychedelic, don't don't you think? I mean, don't you think that the times we're living in seem a little out there? Most definitely. The most shocking thing for me to contend with now is the fact that we have an incumbent president in quarantine in a hospital. I have to be honest. I've been trying to make peace with this idea of holding in your mind the idea of a strong leader who asserts and projects energy, juxtaposing that with the image of Donald Trump in a hospital gown or maybe hooked up to life support or perhaps even a ventilator. I know some of his doctors were hesitant to say that whether or not he had been on oxygen, but um, that's what's been on my mind. I think that's the most unusual thing about the current circumstances. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree that that the this man who who is supposed to lead us, um, and who has spoke out, you know, uh, against this virus, who is who is even, you know, uh, masked. He he sort of poo pooed those, but then he wore them. And I, you gotta give him his credit. He did end up wearing a mask whenever he mm -hmm. sees it fit. But you know, this is a guy who downplayed this uh, disease for for months and months and months. And um, you know, whether he's right or wrong about that, uh, you know, the the fact of the matter is that he is suffering from that same thing that he's been sort of downplaying for the last, you know, six months. Um, I don't I don't know. Like, how does that resonate with you? I mean, does that does that resonate true? I mean, do you feel like he's been downplaying this disease? I think that when we look back into the past, we do so with a bias. It's called a hindsight bias. And basically what it means is, since we know what happened now, when we look back into the past, we still have that same information that something happened. So I think going back to January, January 31st, when the travel restrictions were first put into place, um, a lot of people were opposed to that because it was difficult to see how far this would go. I remember at the time when Donald Trump was talking about closing the country, um, Mr. Biden was criticizing him uh, about being a xenophobe because a lot of people were, you know, that's a pretty radical step, closing the country and banning travel. So a lot of people reacted very strongly against that. And I think Mr. Biden's heart was in the right place. You know, I don't think Mr. Biden had the foresight either to know that this would be such a horrible um, situation. So I think that his reaction, his emotional reaction that maybe President Trump was a racist or a xenophobe is reasonable to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and that's part of the reason why I, I'm not I'm not a Trump supporter, but I'm also not a Biden supporter as well. You know, I mean, that's part of the reason. And um, yeah, you know, I, I wanted to start out. I want. I thought we were going to start out real light here. I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about music before we got into it, but fuck it, we're in it. Um, mm. No, I, and I'm not a Biden guy either. I, I think Biden is just this impotent excuse for for uh, for uh, for an offering. You know, of, of mm. uh, is this really our best? You know, is this our best and brightest? Is this the the person? But that's not how we choose leaders anymore. Right. I mean, we don't choose leaders on the best and brightest. We it seems that we choose leaders on who has the most money or who can raise the most money. It's a popularity contest. Generally, the outcome of elections are decided by two factors, propaganda and corporate sponsorship. And what I mean by propaganda is merely information that's designed to get you to make decisions without going through the effort of thinking critically about it. And that's exactly what a political ad is vote for this candidate, make this decision real quick. I approve this message. Now go vote. Like I'm not, I'm not asking you to do research on me. I'm saying just listen to this ad and then go vote. And that would fit the definition of propaganda. But of course, the more money you have from your corporate sponsors, the more effective of a propaganda campaign you can run. More money means more dollars. More dollars means more time spent on the television, uh, more advertising space while you're browsing through your favorite websites. So I say whoever is the master of these two mechanisms generally wins the race. Now, there is a, 
there's this interesting point that you've been coming bringing up uh that you've been touching on in your streams and even on some of these panels that you've been doing, which I've been enjoying the panels, but it's just such an inefficient way, especially when you have like 20 people yelling over each other. It's just, to me personally, it is hard to handle, <laughs> but yeah, the debate, the debate model fails as a teaching tool. It, it can be entertaining to see people go back and forth and interrupt, but people generally don't prepare their hearts to listen prior to a debate. They're preparing their heart to, dig deep into their entrenched positions and defend them, not to open their hearts and listen to someone else. But it can be entertaining. But as a teaching tool, you're correct. It fails. <laughs> oh, man. It, it, it's just, it, for me, it's it's frustrating. And, and I guess that's the failure part of teaching, right? It's it's It, it frustrates people or it, it just makes them angry or, or, mm -hmm. you, or, or you get half of the, the information. Uh, you get like two minutes of, or, or not even two minutes, like five seconds of information before someone's jumping over, you know, the table to get a piece of the action. So it, it's, it's just, uh, it's hard for me. But one thing that you've been sort of touching on and, and sort of in, in how we look at our leaders and how we, uh, I don't know, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm just interested in what the relevance is to, uh, to how we choose our leaders, but how... Our leaders are there to collect power, to uh, uh, make money, make money for themselves, make money for their friends, and it, this comes as such a shocker to people um, when when you say that, you know, like, well, mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's even shocking to people, but like, I, what I've noticed on debates and stuff um, is that people don't really know how to respond to that because I, I don't know if they're seeing the relevance to their thought process and how they're coming to their own conclusions about who they want to elect. Yeah, because if, if you identify as a Democrat, if that is a part of your identity, when someone comes and says that your champion and your party is just like the opposition, that's going to offend you on the belief level. So when you offend someone at that level, it's not intended to be offensive, but I think it uh, most of the time is because people hold these truths to be deep, deep down at the foundation of who they are. And, and that's essentially what a belief is. A belief is a general assumption. It may or may not be factual, but it tends to be something you believe. Like there is a God, there is no God. People are generally good, people are generally bad, right? These are your beliefs. And so if you believe that political parties are, are fundamentally different and someone is coming and saying that regardless of who's in power, they're going to seek their own advantage and not yours. I can see how that can come as a shocker, especially if they haven't heard that before. Yeah, and and, and what what you know, I, I guess I, I guess it's it's just the relevance to their argument and how they you know like I don't think that it, it they don't see the relevance because it doesn't fit sort of the ideology that they believe they're voting for. Mm -hmm. um, because because I don't know if. I don't know if these candidates have any real ideology that they follow. Uh, I'm just, you know, if, if ideology isn't the core of what they uh, of what they follow and how they lead, what is it that is motivating our leaders, in mm -hmm. your opinion? Good question. So there used to be a time when men did fight for ideas. It used to be that the differences between your political rivals were fundamental and ideologic. You know, you could say one politician subscribes to Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes was all about seizing your enemies beforehand and crushing them, not to make political or uh, financial gain, but just to protect yourself from them coming together and attacking you all at once. He felt that you had to have a sovereign in place. And what made a sovereign qualified wasn't his personal disposition or beliefs, but his ability to underwrite and protect and administer the social contract equally among everyone. But when you think about today and how leaders are chosen, uh, the criteria is quite different. They're not separated by fundamentals. If you go into the ready room and you listen to Donald Trump speak to his immediate direct reports, they're not reading um, John Locke or Thomas Hobbes. They're not opening up the old books of philosophy. They're talking to their friends, their constituents, and they're making their decisions based on where their interests are going to be best served. 
So the differences that we have are political and financial. They are no longer ideologic. Yeah. Um, it's it's just if both of these if both of these candidates are essentially the same, then what's the point and and who is dictating why there is such tension? Hmm. So what do the Democratic and the Republican Party stand for? I think most people would say they stand for me. I feel myself to be a conservative. Therefore, the Republican Party, because they generally say that they're conservatives, I feel that this is the party that rec that represents me. But what is the purpose of the Republican Party? It's not to necessarily represent anyone. The manifest function of a political party is to get its political candidates into positions of power. Because if it fails to do that, it can't do anything else because that's how it gains its power, putting individuals into positions. So what your political parties are is they are hollow now because of the big tent paradox. The big tent paradox states that when a political party first starts, it tries to appeal to a core constituency. It makes stances, it puts forth ideas that differentiate it and make it unique. But a political party needs votes, it needs members. So they have to expand their membership. And the way they do that is by watering down their message so that they can attract more members. In the process of getting bigger though, they move further and further away from their core identity. And this has happened to both political parties, which is why Donald Trump could have very easily ran as a Democrat. There was nothing fundamentally obtuse about him that made running as a Democrat impossible. You could say practically the same thing about Joe Biden. I mean, if you were to see Donald Trump all by himself and hear his ideas, there would be nothing in and of itself that he says that would identify him as a Republican. Everything a Republican president can say, a Democratic president can say. And I think that when you get to that point where you can't tell them apart, then maybe they're not all that different from one another. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and boy, I mean, it's just caused so much. I mean, just this whole, you know, everything that is sort of boiling over at this point. And, uh, you know, like you said, the now the, the president is in the hospital because of COVID and our stock market is soaring mm -hmm. yet, you know, 40% of small businesses are closing and, you know, millions of Americans are going hungry and, mm -hmm. you know, people are on the verge of losing everything. I don't, I mean, how do you see this sort of, how do you see this sort of flattening out? How do you see these tensions sort of, I mean, I know the pandemic is a big part of it, and this and COVID is a big part of it. But how do you see this panning out, especially with this election coming up? How do you how do you see twenty twenty one sort of panning out? I see twenty twenty one being probably just like twenty twenty. Mm. Most people are going to get up and go to work, and they're going to work the same jobs they're working now. Mm. Most people are going to kiss their spouse. They're going to be married to the same person they're married to now. They're going to be raising the same children they're raising now, attending the same schools, the same classes, making the same plans, completing those plans. So I think for most people, life is going to go on as normal. Life is going to be very different for Donald Trump if he wins the election. It's going to be especially different if he loses. Same thing for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But for most people, it's next year around this time is going to look probably a lot more like this. I think a bigger factor that's going to determine how next year looks is COVID-19. I think that what we're doing now, this quarantine, this higher dependence on technology and streaming, I think that this is going to play a far more effective role in shaping 2021 than the political election. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with, uh, especially when you think about how um, businesses are sort of uh, they're they're shutting down offices. They're like, why are we paying rent? You know, wh when you think about the technology and how this has forced us to sort of like, we don't longer need an office space for people to gather. That's ridiculous. We could just mm -hmm. do it from our home. Uh, but that also leaves abandoned buildings and, and that local tax is no longer, you know, that, that property tax is no longer being collected. Uh, so mm -hmm. there, there's a problem with that. But what, what, what I was going at <laughs> besides, you know, sad property taxes, is that that mm. that I think that you're right that this whole streaming thing and and how we communicate is sort of going to be how it is for now on, 
It's like it's the reason why I've sort of just I don't really care about IRL gigs anymore. Like I'm not really interested. I'm telling people no right now because I I'm too interested in building this. This is so yeah. much more interesting to me. It's so much more fun. Um, mm-hmm. I see much more results. Like I, I I get more results out of putting my effort into this than I do into uh, playing a gig in in real life. Because, mm-hmm. you know, like the idea of a gigging musician who, who has music they want to spread is that you, you play shows and concerts, you sell your CDs, mm-hmm. and after doing that for years and years and building a fan base, you know, you maybe will be able to, you know, pack a little club in, in Dallas. You know, hopefully. When you, when you arrive, people will be there. Hopefully. But that's not a guarantee. And, it's just, and, and, and now it's not even a possibility for me. Uh, yeah. So point. imagine now living in a world where you can just press a button and instead of having to get into a bus and pack up your gear, <laughs> you can bring 20,000 people into your home and they can just watch you DJ and scratch or watch a full band mm-hmm. perform. Think about how this is shaping conversations between parents and children. You know, it used to be, it used to be that when you were a child, your parents would talk to you about going to college. The focus was, we're going to get you some good grades so we can get you into a good school, so we can get you into a good high school, so we can get you into a good uh, college, we can get you a good job. But now that's not really the only route. There have always been other routes, but now think about if you were 20 years younger than you are now or 15 years and you started live streaming, where would you be now after grinding for 10, 20, 10, 15 years? So I'm saying children now have a rebuttal to their parents. Mom, dad, this isn't such a waste of time anymore. There's potential here. If I put time and energy into this, this can be more lucrative than going to college and being a doctor. So I'll be interested to know how those conversations are unfolding at the dinner table with families and how parents are coping with this brand new avenue for revenue in their life. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, with, with, uh, with, 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 it's it's been really interesting with uh, with the, with my son. I have a six year old who's a first grader. So uh, we we decide since me and my wife work from home, we don't. We saw what was going on in the schools, and mm. it's not, it's just not conducive for us. Like our son didn't care for it at all. You know, like he didn't like kindergarten. Like, how do you not like kindergarten? I remember <laughs> kindergarten. I had a great time in kindergarten. It was just coloring. And, and, you know, ABCs and, and sitting with your legs crisscross applesauce. You know, it was just the whole thing. It was, it, for me, it was great memories. For my son, it was just this horrifying thing. And then now add, uh, add this pandemic. It was just, it was too much. So we, we were doing the homeschool thing. But how lucky are we that we were able to, uh, we're able to be musicians. And we had to go to D.C. this last week. And, um we were able to take our son with us. We didn't have to worry about taking him out of school. We didn't have to worry about this. So it's been really interesting and and seeing how he's been taken to technology and seeing how where the future is going. I don't I don't necessarily oppose him getting into streaming. I don't necessarily mm-hmm. oppose him getting onto um, um, n- not not like Facebook or anything like that, but like mm-hmm. getting involved in in a social network of people because I, I that's where this is sort of going um mm. i don't know what how does your wife feel about that it's, it's her idea <laughs> oh yeah it's definitely the future it's definitely the future. i mean Go ahead. 10 years from now we are going to be far more into streaming than we are now so think about some of the giants of streaming some mm. of the names here on this platform who've been hustling every day i'm hustling for years <laughs> and now here they are at the top of this mountain that corporations are just now beginning to climb mm. and they have years of experience years of followers um, we might be looking at the dawn of a brand new aristocracy of streaming and i mean that sincerely mm. uh what do you mean expand on that Sure. So when you think about an aristocracy, an aristocracy would be your upper crust in society. Generally, these are individuals who are extremely wealthy and landed, and they also have the political party. I mean, the political power, right? By virtue, not of people's vote of confidence, but because of their position, their wealth, their land, and their influence that they have in society. 
So when I think about some of the big fish right now, some of these guys are blue whales. Mm. You go in their rooms and it's like 70,000 people. That's like a blue whale yeah. of live streaming. Now I'd say Donald Trump, I've seen some of his rallies on YouTube pull in um, 20, 30,000, um, 50, 70. I mean, as, as the election comes closer, I think the number is going to go up. But this is the president of the United States breaking around 100,000. But you have kids on Twitch that have been breaking 100,000 and streaming for a while. So the president, the office of the president has just got involved in streaming and look at the numbers it's doing. Yeah. And the kids who've been here for years are actually outperforming. They have a further reach in streaming than the United States president. So what a massive head start. And what kind of influence does this give them? It gives them tremendous influence, maybe not necessarily direct political power like an aristocrat would, but when it comes to influencing 100,000 young people, well, this may as well be political power because when these young people go into the world, what they saw on Twitch with their favorite streamer is going to shape their politics. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's crazy how these, these uh, I mean, streamers or even these independent media sources are, are, are really killing it with... Um, with, with with numbers and I mean, if we just strictly look at the numbers, it, it, it influence in numbers, right? Mm. I mean, CNN, what does that get in, in any given night on a good night? It, it's not very many. But if you look at Joe Rogan podcast, he's getting I, I don't know if it, I think this is totally wrong, but he was getting an overall download of, of a billion or something. I think that's probably right. Way wrong. But it was like. It was an exorbitant amount of people listening to him, and who has more influence? You know, like who mm. who is who is who's dictating what? Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, the lines are sort of getting blurred, but it, I think they're blurring out sort of this mainstream idea of how people consume information. Um, so think of it this way: if Donald Trump, Joe Rogan, and let's say Ninja all went live at the same time, yeah. who do you feel would have more viewers? Would it be the president necessarily? No, I don't. I, I, I would almost guarantee it's not the president. Which, what do you think that says about our country? Mm, I, I don't think it tells us anything about young people that we didn't already know. Mm. That when you're younger and you don't have a lot invested in society, you probably don't care about where the political power is. But as you get older and you start to accumulate wealth and resources and goods, businesses, family, now you're more concerned about where your money and your time is being applied. So as you grow older, your ears begin to widen. And now that dog whistle that used to be politics is a lot louder and it resounds. Now you begin to take positions that you couldn't really think of before. Now when you hear someone say something, it's not so boring as it was when you were in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Now you can actually sit through an entire political debate and be engaged the whole time. And this is simply a sign that you're growing and you're developing. But I don't think this tells us anything about young people that we didn't know already. Young people are generally um, deaf when it comes to two things, politics and God. But as you get older, God's voice, as well as the voice of your president, get louder. Yeah. Yeah. A, a point that I really like uh, that you make is that people people vote with their pocketbooks, you know, Um one of the one of the things that uh, because it was a, I remember it was a surprise to me that that you were a Trump supporter and why is that why was that a surprise to me which uh, which I don't know if you're a Trump supporter I'm sorry I don't mean to, I don't know if you support him but I know that you were talking about voting for him or or at least in his favor you were talking about uh, voting with your pocketbook or I think I'm getting things wrong right now and I hate mm -hmm. to misquote you but. Uh, you seem to lean towards Trump, which surprised me and which surprised a lot of people, which in these last few months, I've sort of stopped being like, why are you surprised about any of this? Like, why is this surprising? <laughs> you know, because I'm coming from it. You know, like I have, you know, I have Mexican friends. I'm a Mexican. Uh, I have Mexican friends who, you know, I'm just like, how could you do that? How could you? You're a fucking race trader, you know, and and over time, I've learned that that's just. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. You can't write off people who who have a different opinion than you. You can't just be like you are this now because you. Th it's nonsense. Um, so it was surprising to me. But 
why do you think that it's surprising to people when they see you and you're a Trump supporter? I mean, there's some obvious. Well, I think it's I think it's obvious. Yeah. You know, if you if you take a look at my face, I mean, look at this face. Look at me. Yeah. And I think that there's one very important feature that stands out that is in stark contrast to what some people might find to be a favorable attitude about Donald Trump about me. And I think if we're honest about this, we can talk about it without getting offended. And clearly it's the fact that I have a beard. <laughs> I think that's what stands out and that's what shocks people. Yeah, I think but there are, are lots around. of bearded people yeah. who support the incumbent president. But let's talk about Donald Trump. This is the thing that resonates to me about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a person who values and acknowledges the influence and the irresistible momentum of power. And this is a man who has dedicated his life to acquiring power. And that means that there's something inside of Donald Trump, a flame inside of him that is similar to the flame in me because I feel very strongly in the same way. You have to accumulate power because without power, what do you have? You have the mercy of others. But when the mercy of others runs out, you'll have nothing else to stand on because you never built anything for yourself. So just as a man, that resonates and calls out to me. Now, as a politician, there's some things that I don't particularly like um, about Donald Trump. I don't like the fact that he resumed weapon sales with Saudi Arabia. Um, I probably wouldn't have done that once I found out that there may or may not have been some involvement on the part of Saudi Arabia when it came to carrying out acts of terrorism in um, Yemen and other areas in that part of the world. That's something me and Donald Trump could sit and maybe um, have a nice firm talk about. But in reality, voicing support for Donald Trump allows me to indulge a guilty pleasure of mine. And I say this almost with a sense of boyish shame. I really like to frustrate and enrage my enemies. And never has there been an easier way of doing that. And I don't think there ever will be an easier method of infuriating so many people that I don't like than simply saying, I like the president. So I enjoy having that power over people and I'm going to mourn it when it is no longer mine. <laughs> and now freestyle rap. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Which I love, absolutely. I love that, by the way. Bro, that... if I ever became president, I'm freestyling right after I'm sworn in. I'm going to be like, <laughs> I'm going to get to my inauguration speech, but first off, let me go ahead and drop some heat and then just heat up the January. Just flame it up. They're going to be like, oh my God, what is he doing? So many white faces are going to look like this. <laughs> my stars. <laughs> what is this? Oh, heavens. I told you about them. <laughs> He was supposed to be one of the good ones. Yeah. Oh um, but yeah, that would be a blast. I would do, I would hit it. I'm like, I'm a, <laughs> we gonna get to the swearing in part, but first off, I'm gonna drop some heat and heat up this, uh, <laughs> drop some bars and heat up this cold January morning. <laughs> DJ drop that beat. Oh my God, that'd be amazing. Uh, we, there was a question here that I, that I missed. Uh, uh, conversely, conversely, okay. Uh, there, sorry. We speak English good. Uh, there's also a huge influx with people coming into Twitch. With, would this be a bubble that'll burst after things get oversaturated? Do you, do you think that it'll be a bubble that'll burst? I think that that's inevitable because when you look at the business model of a live streaming platform, it's only a matter of time before things get too diluted. And it's almost like a foot race. If you get to the live streaming platform early and you have the advantage of being first and you can establish an audience, you will put yourself further and further away and secure yourself against that eventual burst. And what makes it a bubble is the fact that in order for streamers to be successful, most people on Twitch have to either not stream or fail at streaming so that the bigger names can have a higher concentration of the audience that comes into the platform. And it's almost inevitable because when you think about some of the bigger names here, these individuals are recommended heavily when you first come to, to Twitch, when you click on the main page. And sometimes even when you're watching another stream, you'll see a recommendation on the side panel for one of these big names. And so with advertising and marketing like that, it's gonna be difficult for anyone else to hold a, a candle to them. 
But when you think about that that bubble, when finally there are too many streamers and not enough people watching those streams, some of those original OGs are going to be okay. They will have reached a height in that mountain to where they don't have to worry about tumbling back to the bottom. And even if they did, they have a parachute that's going to carry them down. And that parachute is a loyal core following of about 10 to 20,000 viewers that will never, ever leave them. It doesn't matter right. what else comes to Twitch. I'm absolutely going to be at this stream. I grew up here. I experienced puberty here. I've talked to this person about things I've never even spoken to my family about. So I'm writing with XQC or I'm writing with Tim the Tapman or Nick Merckx, never leaving them. Yeah. But some of the earlier, some of the later people, it's they may not have an opportunity to establish that loyal of a following and to make it that big at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I've talked to a few streamers about this, about, you know, you know, the, the, the question how it comes up usually is, you know, at, because of the influx of, of users due to the pandemic, um, you know, as things sort of even out and <clears throat> we get, you know, our, our, um, our, 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 our vaccines or whatever in order, uh, and, and as people go back to work and stuff, that that it's gonna flatten out. Mm -hmm. um, but but I've gotten a lot of different answers about it because some people don't think it's gonna pop. They don't think the bubble's gonna pop um, because of examples like YouTube. Uh, you have mm. you have people like Justin Bieber and um, a myriad of other people who came from YouTube who are now mainstream because YouTube mm. it was I mean was once and still is kind of considered not mainstream although you know some of those youtube stars they walk in front of a crowd of young girls they might as well be justin bieber um but mm. when how you... lucky justin bieber was right to be singing i mean there is a there is a myriad of talented extremely talented musicians on youtube Absolutely. but of all of the musicians there i believe it was was it usher raymond yes that saw him mm -hmm. usher raymond happened to be happened to see at the right moment at the right time Justin Bieber and was like, who is this kid? But think about all of the other tens and thousands. And I mean, they're just as talented as Justin Bieber, mm -hmm. maybe even more so. Maybe they've been grinding harder and longer, but they just didn't have luck. Yeah. They just weren't lucky enough to to catch Usher Raymond at that moment when he was like, hey, let's fly that kid out here and do some work together. Yeah. Yeah. See what comes of it. Well, uh, well, and then when you see where those careers went and, and you see how, you know, people come out of YouTube all the time and get Netflix specials and Netflix shows or TV shows, all the whole thing, uh, they, they're kind of people who are defending the Twitch bubble, never popping, are, are sort of mm -hmm. tossing to or, or going to YouTube as an example uh, mm -hmm. because YouTube never – go ahead, please. Oh, please. Um, I was going to say, now, now that I'm thinking about this bubble – <clears throat> there might be a way to stave off the bubble bursting. I would say that Twitch and Amazon have a vested interest in making sure that Twitch stays as profitable of uh, of a website for as long as, and I think they're doing a, a, a pretty swell job at that. We're talking year over year yeah. growth. I mean, just massive growth, shutting down other com competitors. Yeah. You know, other people want to get in. You're not getting in this market. Get on out of <laughs> here. R.I.P. Mixer. R.I.P. Yeah. <laughs> Go on and get on out of here. Um, so I think they're doing a bang up job yeah. at, at that. And But when I think about it now, there might be a way to artificially stave off the bubble from bursting. Oh. Maybe when you see it getting too saturated, you could push some people out. <laughs> uh, how do you do that? How do you push people out of a, out of a platform like this? Well... I, I do not want to infer motive or clandestine tactics on the part of Twitch. Twitch has been nothing but hospitable to me and my community. And I look forward to growing and developing a greater uh, partnership um, with Twitch moving forward into the future. But hypothetically, let's say that there was a streaming platform, not Twitch, because Twitch, of course, would, would never do anything like this. And I mean that sincerely. Um, but let's say that there was a hypothetical streaming platform that had a lot of streamers and not enough viewers to go around and it was getting a little saturated. One thing they might choose to do is maybe take a bigger name that is drawing a lot of viewers, maybe find a way to end this individual or this person's contract so that this person has to leave the platform 
therefore sending that fresh crowd and crop of viewers back into the Twitch ocean mm. to be consumed by other streams, or maybe introducing a pay to watch feature. We can save off that bubble because now there's a higher level of entry, or um, maybe just even raising the qualifications to be a streamer, mm. right? Right now, anybody can stream, but maybe in the future, it could be you have to have already an established following in another platform to stream on Twitch. You know, you can stream any other place, but streaming on Twitch is a premium. And we only offer that to people who have reached a certain level of prestige mm -hmm. in social media. Hmm. That, though, that's interesting. That's, that, that, that's what I love about your, your, you have a great sense of analysis. Like um, when, when, like, especially in the moment, like being able to, someone will present a problem to you. You'll take the seven breaths and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll come back with some fire. Um, it, I love that. I love that uh, level of analysis. I, I wish I had that, but you know, it's it's just it's fine. It, that's you. That's how your mind works, and and that's awesome, man. And and that's why I think people um, are flocking to you, um, especially with your stream. And, and you're saying Twitch was, is is quite um, you know hospitable to you and your your community, and um, kind of what you're talking about there is deep deplatforming. Is that sort of what you're talking about, or are you just sort of t I mean, in a sense, you're talking about deplatforming? Yeah, I, I would say that hypothetical platform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. streaming platform of course not twitch and i mean this genuinely twitch of course um would never do anything like this but a hypothetical plat um, streaming platform would have a way but then but then again you could i know on the outset you could say well this is underhanded but not really because if we have a clause in our contract with you that says that if you do xyz you know, some contracts have what's called a morality clause mm. that states that you have to maintain a certain level of moral integrity. And if we feel that you have reached a level of moral degradation to the extent to where it begins to affect the brand, we reserve the right to cancel our contract with you. And I think that that's fair. Companies spend a lot of time and money making their brand. Twitch getting to where it is now was not a mistake. Someone spent a lot of time and effort, a lot of time away from their family, just grinding and hustling to get it here. And these individuals deserve to be rewarded by making sure that their work isn't spoiled by someone who has bad manners. Yeah. So, so you're okay with, you're okay with the idea of deplatforming. You're okay with that. Like, like, like for instance, Alex Jones is the classic example of how he sort of got deplatformed off of you know, Apple iTunes and YouTube, I mean, all at once for his, you know, his, his what he was saying about Sandy Hook and the shooting down there. Mm -hmm. um, you think that's okay? You're okay with that? I think I'm okay with the principle mm -hmm. of people enforcing the way that other people use their stuff. Mm -hmm. Like right now, we are using Twitch's stuff. Right. Twitch is not mine. This is not my network. I'm not the one who grinded to make Twitch um, a platform where millions of people can be reached. I'm not the one who put in the coding to create the, the platform and the website. Someone else did, and they deserve the right to decide how their stuff is used. So when you come to Twitch and you agree to use their stuff, um, you should play by their rules. You're agreeing to the rules. In the beginning, you were okay with the rules because you read them and you said, okay, seems like a good idea, and you agreed. So later on, if these people who are allowing you to use their stuff, take their stuff back, well, it's their stuff. It's your stuff. You can do what you want with it. The answer to that is to get your own stuff so no one can take it from you. Yeah. But, but then it's like, how do you build your own stuff on the magnitude of Twitch's stuff or YouTube yeah. stuff? <laughs> you have to start at the bottom, like Rudyard Kipling says. With those same worn out tools, you start right at the beginning of where you fell and you build it up again and you don't breathe another word about your loss. Mm -hmm. And when you think about getting banned or deplatformed, it's like a falling star. Yeah. When I think about someone being deplatformed, I think about getting a news flash that a star is falling outside. And you know, it's only going to happen, it doesn't happen that often that a star falls. So when someone is told that a star is falling outside their house, they, they immediately run outside to see it. Yeah. And I think the same thing happens when you hear that someone is being deplatformed. People want to know, well, what happened? What happened? Even people who don't know you want to know, well, what did this person do? Yeah. How did this star fall all the way down to the earth? And that gives you incredible opportunity 
incredible reach to new markets, a new audience, everyone rushing to see this catastrophe. Okay, I'm glad you're here. My name's Alex Jones, follow me to this stuff if you wanna support my stuff. So I think that there's room for a strong rebound when you get deplatformed because so many Google hits, so many Facebook messages, so many trending topics on Twitter, you can, you can use that to bounce back with that momentum as long as you have a place to channel it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing too. I mean, you're seeing Alex Jones, he's functioning, he's still going, you know, who, who else got, who else got deplatformed? Who's doing okay. There, I mean, uh, oh my Dr. God. D Dr. D. Oh yeah. He's doing great. Um, doing where, great. Where did um, he go? I think he's on uh, YouTube now, but oh. this guy's still pulling in like 50, 70,000 people watching. So killing it. Yeah, still killing it because still... he's he's such a he's such an OG that he had that we were talking about immunity to that bubble. He's such an OG that he's going to have an audience, a core audience of like 40, 50,000 people who will follow him anywhere. And this almost makes you immune to deplatforming. Yeah. Because wherever you go, your audience is going to follow you. Yeah, and, and even when you look at like sort of right now Joe Rogan or maybe the news cycle is past Joe Rogan, but uh, the he was coming under fire because of his Spotify things, and and then of course the trans stuff comes up again that he because he speaks out against uh, trans fighters, uh, specifically uh, men who trans transition into women and then fight women on uh in in mma you know a, a mortal combat so um so he speaks out against that and so now it's all sort of coming back again because it just comes in waves but he's so big he's so he has so many people his platform is so mm-hmm. huge is like you you can't you can't touch him like this dude can mm-hmm. go to spotify and he's gonna do just fine and he's gonna dump like and it's insane to think about like to dump you know that youtube and dump the the itunes reach and dump all that reach and just go all in with spotify i mean that's a big move and um mm. and i'm sure he'll be just fine you know yeah i think he made a hundred million dollars out of the deal that's yeah. how much it was said to be worth yeah this guy's gonna do just <laughs> fine yeah he's it's okay but when but when you have money like that for so long we don't really talk about this because we we tend to we tend to condemn the wealthy more than we try to identify with them. But think about the burden of wealth, mm. right? The weight of having a lot of money. In the beginning, it's so good. You can eat all the food you couldn't have when you were a kid. You can go all the places your parents couldn't afford to take you. You can buy all the cars you grew up wanting to drive. But what happens when you have bought everything in the shopping malls? What happens when you've kissed and made love to the most beautiful woman? Now, where do you get your kicks? Yeah. Right now, for the common person who doesn't have a lot of money, they hold on to the idea that one day they'll be able to taste the good life, Thanks and they never follow. quite really get there. Um, so that that desire to taste that good life always sort of pushes them forward. But what happens when you get a taste of the good life and you become accustomed to it way too early? Well, the rest of your life is going to be boring. I think it was John Mellencamp that says, oh yeah, life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone. So if you're young and you're rich and you've tasted everything, you have a lot of life left to live. And so I hope you've left a lot of things or enough things to do to keep you interested because once the thrill of living is gone, you still have to stick around for the rest of your days. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a that's a, that's a huge... <laughs> That's a huge thing I've been talking about. I'm kind of on the show, and actually, it was somebody in here. I had I had a guest on Snooze Mew. Um, we were kind of talking about how this weird, not weird. It's it's something that's been around for a while, but like how uh, pedophilia sort of runs rampant in these circles. And we're sort of talking about how does one get to that point. And I think you kind of hit it. It's like when if you've been rich your whole life and your and your family's a dynasty and mm-hmm. and and, and you, like where do you go? How do you go up? How do you get high? You know, like mm-hmm. you know without drugs. You know, but I'm saying how do you get higher than <laughs> where you're at? And I guess it it, it kind of twists on itself and and it can go in that direction of 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 you know, I, I can have any woman I want. What about this? You know, so yeah. And then there's always that allure of the fact that you're told you can't have it. So what do you mean I can't have it? I can have anything I want. So for some people who have wealth and power, 
being told that they can't have sex with kids is a tem- is taunting. What do you mean I can't do it? I can have anything I want. So you have individuals who do that, not necessarily because they like kids, but just to assert the fact that they are immune and the law does not apply to them. They can have whatever they want, whenever they want. They can have your son. They can have your daughter. They can set up studios in Hollywood where parents will bring their kids and offer them to offer them up. Here's my beautiful son and daughter here. Just do whatever you want. Just put them in an advertisement or put them in this movie. And they get, I mean, sitting on the top of the crushed bodies of children who are considered to be untouchable. I can even get to your kids. That's an incredible power rush for these individuals. So even if they're not necessarily pedophiles, just the idea of doing it because I can, can be satisfying enough. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's just, yeah, it's, it's fucking gross, man. But um, I, I kind of wanted to kind of step back for a second and, um, cause we were kind of talking about deplatforming and, you know, um, you know, there's this argument is like, is, are these social media platforms, uh, or, um, is it a utility, right? Is this now that mm-hmm. it's so big and the, and it's the way we can communicate on it is so has become so integral to our everyday lives that now people are expecting it to be sort of these utilities. And, um, so it, it's like who makes these decisions on what is okay to put on these platforms if we're looking at it through the lens of that these a utility um who's who's making these decisions who's censoring who who's making the you know and so mm. um which I, I mean which can affect you directly because of the content of your channel you know what i mean it's because of mm. how twitch is sort of leaning right um uh, oh, not i'm sorry not leaning right but it's a left-leaning company amazon mm-hmm. you know you look at what they uh put forth but do you think that under the guise of a of a utility um do you think that it is still okay and 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 who are making these decisions um i mean do you think that it should be a utility do you think that uh, social media and platforms like twitch should be looked at as a utility or do you think it should just be a business and keep mm-hmm. it as that we'll start there and we'll we'll go mm-hmm. for it after <laughs> i would not consider social media to be a utility because you can live a life, a fair, righteous life, and get your needs met without social media. You may, <laughs> you may not be able to do that if you didn't have running water in your home. Right. Right. You may not be able to do that if you didn't have electricity in your home. Mm-hmm. But if you didn't have Facebook in your home, I think you'll find a way <laughs> to tuck yourself in at night and get over that. You'll have you know, you'll eat something that next morning. And be like you know what I got food. You know I was upset about Facebook, but I think I'm good. But you probably couldn't do that if you didn't have any lights on, or um, if there was no air conditioning because you had no no coal plant or any um, power source in your area giving you power. Um, social media is definitely a luxury. Mm. It's just that we're so entitled. Mm. We feel that we are owed luxuries. If you have a social media account you are quite privileged. I mean, it's not your stuff. You didn't buy it. Someone gave it to you. It was free. So already um, you're quite privileged to even be in a country where there is an internet connection to where you can even tap into a social media network like Facebook. So um, again, you're privileged to be on, on a social media platform and I think keeping that in mind that this is a privilege to be here, to be in front of so many people, will keep you humble and keep you on the righteous path. Yeah. So when it comes, so I, I want to talk about your podcast, which is Meditations of Men. And um, <clears throat> how, given the climate of today, mm-hmm. uh, especially in regards to identity politics, um, you know, having a podcast like Meditations of Men could seem, not to me, I'm not saying this, but to some could seem, I don't know, toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because you talk, because you're not using any pronouns, you know, you're not doing the they's or the Z's or Z, Z's or you're saying gentlemen, you're saying women, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're sticking to these gender normative terms, I guess. <laughs> 
Um, how do you how do you how would you respond to someone who views your your podcast as toxic masculinity as something that's promoting? I, I mean, and, and I'm sure you've gotten this. I, I think I've. I mean, at least or some sort of thing. I mean, cause I think what I see a lot in your thing is like you allow racists to be here, or you're a misogynist, or something like that. So yeah, everybody's welcome. If you're racist, if you are a misogynist. Um, please come to Meditations Within. We would love to hear from you. What I really want to do, and this is going to be tough to do, but what I want to do is I want to find <clears throat> a genuine racist, not someone who's just trolling on Twitch, typing nonsense or gibberish, but someone who can make a coherent argument for racial bias and racial discrimination, just so we can prepare ourselves for encountering these attitudes in the real world and just to give ourselves an opportunity to hear a rational argument for an ideology that a lot of people subscribe to. But the idea, but the problem with that is when you're on Twitch, very seldom do you get worthy enemies that way. Because if you are a, a confessed racist, very few channels, like I said, when you're using other people's stuff, very few of them are gonna want you to grow there. So they might push you off. So generally when it comes to racists on Twitch, um, you just get trolls, racist trolls. But um, what I'm interested in is engaging with these ideas because it's only by engaging with these ideas that you can ever even hope to dismiss them. But I think that e if you're able to even get someone who is a confessed racist into a discussion of race with people who are a different race, then in a way you've already won because I got you to come and sit down and talk to me, which is something you probably would not have done. So you are at least willing to entertain the idea that a person who is of a different race, perceived race, um, can have a discussion with you. But when it comes to, I wanna talk about what you said before about the pronouns and this and that, that's simply just not my culture. Mm. But I make allowance for other people's cultures. You know, America is a big place and there are many cultures here. And some people's culture, what you said is, perfectly acceptable. If a biological male puts on a dress and some lipstick, um, some people say this person meets the definition of a woman. According to some people's culture, and this is a very popular culture that we see in the media, according to that culture, that is what defines a woman. However, in my culture, um, that's simply not the case. And when it comes to your culture, you can't really deliberately change your culture and how you were raised and influenced. But in my culture 10 years ago, it would have been a little silly to, to, to even have a discussion about what makes a woman a woman 10 years ago. Uh, we could answer that question very quickly. Nowadays, people pause and hesitate. Yeah, and, and do you think that is a, do you think that is a healthy way forward? I think that the, the, the healthiest way to live in a society of other people is by conforming to gender norms. And let me tell you why that is. Let's take two people, two individuals. One of them conforms to gender stereotypes and expectations in society. One does not. They step outside of the box. Just based off of that, gen can we make a general assumption about who you feel will have an easier time just navigating and moving through society, the one who conforms to gender stereotypes or the one who is non-conforming? Who do you feel will have an easier go socially? Yeah, I mean, it's the one who fits the norms, right? I mean, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's utility in that. Um, there's also utility in what gender allows us to do prior to meeting someone. If I know that my audience is going to be a woman, I can prepare and tailor my presentation for her. Um, for example, you have two guys um, or two speakers. One of them knows that the audience is going to be all women. One of them knows, uh, does not know this information, who will have the advantage? Well, the person who knows the gender because they can tailor their presentation to them. So gender stereotypes merely allows us to role play ahead of time and experiment socially with people we have yet to interact with. It gives us a healthy foundation to build our social expectations of others on. And I'll give you another example. Um, I see the utility of gender roles to be analogous to the utility of traffic lights, right? 
we have a general way that we direct traffic. It's with lights, the colors green, amber, and red. Red means stop. Amber means slow down and stop unless it will cause an accident to do so. And of course, green means go. And if you know these things, whether you agree that go should be green or not, if you understand that green means go, you'll have a much easier time navigating in traffic than someone who does not know this. Or imagine going to another place in the world where it's not green, amber, and red, it's black, orange, and purple. It would be extremely confusing to plan your travel because you don't really know what these, wow. Now, what I'm saying is if, if you are a person in America and you want to step outside of this, outside of gender norms and gender roles, um, that is, of course, your prerogative. And I don't feel that anyone should be disrespected or bullied or made to feel bad about themselves simply because they feel more comfortable carrying themselves a certain way. Um, I think that if you really want to touch this person's heart, you should focus on demonstrating that you care about them instead of demonstrating how wrong um, you think that they are. So you're okay with with the idea of, you know, if someone wants to be addressed by they or they or however, you're okay with being civil. Um, but, you know, because when you're saying things like gender norms and, and you know, mm -hmm. you speak positive, positively about these sort of ideas that are looked negatively on now, you know, in some circles. I mean, do, doesn't that doesn't that worry you? Because th that that's enough to be deplatformed for some. That's enough. That kind of talk can be qualified as hate speech. I think what they're generally looking for when, when it comes to hate speech is intentionally targeting a specific group of people for harassment mm. and bullying. And what, what I find to be interesting is the fact that on my uh, stream on Twitch, we've been a community for about two years now, a little more than two years, and we've had every discussion under the sun, mm. race, gender, um, we even had a transgendered individual on stream and it's never resulted in a ban or a dismissal. And it's because, I don't know how I got this lucky, but I just happened to have attracted some very brilliant minds and some very, or maybe just being together in the way that we are has um, created, hold on a second, let me sure. uh, reset, has, has created the sort of mindset that makes such possible. But I, I owe that to to my community because I think what they're what they're primarily worried about is targeting someone or targeting groups. So what I generally do is before we even engage in a discussion, just reminding people that regardless of how you feel about a person, um, you still ought to make it your your purpose um, to be respectful. Um, there's absolutely no reason to disrespect a person. Um, there's absolutely no reason to use violence or physical harm against a person. Um, especially simply because you disagree with how they live their life. There's so much space in this world. Um, you can really distance yourself from anyone that you don't happen to like. So why do anything physical or abusive to them? Just go to a place where people are the way you like them to be. Yeah, yeah I mean, I don't know why. what's wrong with civility. There's nothing wrong with a little civility. Um, but what about when you look at like countries like Canada who sort of – um, uh, I don't even know what the name of that law is, but the, where there, where it's it, it's direct censorship, you know, it's mandated uh, law, lawful censorship. What do you think about civility as as policy? Like, can you you know? Be, can you give me? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I guess I'm. I don't have a good example. Uh, were you asking for an example or something? Um, just can you can you give me some more clarification on exactly what Canada is doing with gender? Well, it's not just gender. It's about it, it's it's their mate. Hold on, let me Canada and uh, what's the name of that law? It's a it's a law where they are, uh, um, where it's becoming where where they're classifying hate speech as as something that can be charged, and I think mm, like a crime. Yes, and and mm. so whereas um, whereas here, if if the KKK wanted to peacefully protest and and talk. They can do that as long as it's peaceful. Mm -hmm. But 
as but in uh in Canada and I don't know if the, section 319 makes it an offense. Let me read it. Section 319 makes it an offense to communicate dude, come on. Let's Section 319 makes it an offense to communicate statements in a public place which incite hatred against an an identifiable oh my gosh an identifiable group where it is likely to lead to a breach of peace the crown prosecutor can proceed either by indictment or a summary of process now that just seems like liability though you know mm-hmm. that just seems like liability laws where if someone's out saying hate speech and trying to get people to commit crimes in the name of hate that that just seems, maybe i'm just kidding I, 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 I see that as as a tool against a difficult situation, right? Because if you have free speech in society, which I think is absolutely necessary mm. to have a free society, people have to be able to say how they feel mm. and um, not be penalized for it. People have to feel like they can they can open up and be honest with each other. But here's the problem. How do you protect yourself from a situation where a person is doing exactly that, but let's say they're just standing on the corner just yelling um, racial epithets, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, technically, this is free speech. However, if they do this long enough, eventually some punches are going to be thrown. Maybe some guns are going to go off. So as a legislator and as a criminal justice system, you have to ask yourself, how do we deal with this? Because typically we can only get involved after someone has been seriously injured, after this person has incited something. So is there any legal tools we can use to prevent this from happening so we can catch it before people get injured and hurt and we have to call ambulances and people gotta go to jail? And I think this is the response, Mm. that if a person is making, um, is abusing their freedom of speech and they're just, you know, and it's pretty clear to observers that this is not constructive Right. There's a difference between going into into the public square and saying, hey, let's have a conversation about race and racial identity and then going into a public square and just standing and yelling the N word over and over and over again. So I think what this does is it gives the legislators some power to have discretion when it comes to telling the difference between people who are legitimately exercising free speech and people who are legitimately trying to make trouble under the guise of free speech. Yeah, and, and you know what? I, I was reading the wrong bill. It, it, it was Bill C-16 in Canada, which hmm. uh, prevents people from using uh, to protect gender identity rights. So you can actually go to jail now for calling someone, um, which I shouldn't just say that. But um, So it says it was added in the Canadian Human Rights Act joining the list of in identifiable a list of identifiable groups that are protected from discrimination. These include age, race, sex, religion, disability, among others. Uh, It was added to a section of the criminal code that targets hate speech defined as advocating genocide and the public incitement of hatred where it joins other identifiable groups. Third, it was added to a section of the criminal code dealing with sentencing for hate crimes. If there's evidence that an offense is motivated by bias, prejudice, or hate, it can mm-hmm. be taken into account during the... Okay, so n- pros noun usage. Uh, does the bill legislate use of certain language, and could someone go to jail for using the wrong pronoun? In the criminal code, which does not reference pronouns, Kosman s- says misusing pronouns alone would not constitute a criminal act. Okay, so the misuse mm-hmm. of gender pronouns without more cannot rise to the level of a crime, she says. It cannot rise to the level of advocating genocide, inciting hatred. Okay, so... Wouldn't that be crazy if you could go to jail because you refuse to call a person her? Yes. And so, but, inter- but interestingly sorry. enough, you cannot go to prison for calling someone the N-word, which right. I think is interesting. When you think about offensive terms, I think the most offensive term probably in English is the N-word with the hard R. Yes. If you want to turn, if you absolutely want to get everyone's attention, <laughs> just yell that word nice and clear and loud and everyone is going to look at you. So what I find interesting about this is that saying the N-word, which is definitely going to get somebody's ass kicked, yeah. that's not against the law. But saying or or the idea of, of calling someone him or her, which is a, these are neutral terms that have nothing, there's nothing respectful 
or disrespectful about these terms. These, these are neutral terms. Mm -hmm. The fact that the, or the idea that this could get you in legal trouble um, would be very tricky territory. So I think it's the part of wisdom. I think, um, I think it's wisdom on their part not to go that far. That'd be outrageous. Yeah, and and I think that there was um <clears throat> there was there was some fight back against it because of um a particular person which comes up in your stream Jordan Peterson he's a Canadian uh, professor out of Toronto I think or somewhere up there <laughs> but he was under fire for refusing to do this and he was a very, uh, he was against C nineteen um, he he has a lot of he has a lot to say in regards to uh, identity politics and how it could lead to basically, it, to surmise it, it could lead to the killing fields of, uh, of, uh, of what's that? Cambodia. That, thank you. Mm. Yeah. So it, basically the socialism side of that, there's this, um, this idea that this can go, keep going further. And like you were saying, it's important for people to be able to, uh, to talk and to be able to freely speak because that's how we sort of find the middle ground. Mm -hmm. it, it, because without one side or the other, it's going to go into extremism, right? It's like mm -hmm. one side just keeps gaining power, 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 and there's no opposition left and right. So it, it is a necessary evil. That, not evil, I'm sorry, that was stupid. Uh, it is necessary because I don't think it's evil. It's just, it, it's just something that's necessary. Um, it, I think it's a necessary thing. I mean... What do you think? What do you think about that? What do you think about the idea of, of, of you know these these state mandated uh, this idea of of not being able to say stuff and, and it becoming policy uh, eventually and and this, this it would is be a, a dis Go it would be a dis it would be a disaster, and it would be very slippery and dangerous ground, which I think is the reason why so many legislative bodies approach that with caution. Because if you put something into law, you have to be willing to enforce it. If you're willing to enforce it, that means that you're saying that you feel comfortable with police officers getting in their squad cars with weapons, driving to the homes of private individuals, knocking on their doors, putting handcuffs on them, putting them in the back of their car, taking them to jail. And if any way along this process, this person resists arrest, the officer can escalate force all the way up to executing them. So when you say that you want something to be a law, what you're saying is that you're comfortable with this reality, cops coming, taking a person to jail, all over the fact that someone said a word. And when you think about the fact that people can die in the course of being arrested, um, inevitably you're gonna have people who die in the process of getting arrested for words that they said. And maybe that's what Maybe that's what Jordan Peterson was alluding to, right? Because what happens if I say a word, okay, well, you're coming with us. No, and I resist. Okay, well, the cops are gonna continue escalating force until I stop resisting all the way up until I'm either dead or in handcuffs. And I'm not sure if we wanna see a world where people can die in police custody merely because they said certain words. Yeah, yeah, um, it's a, God, like I, I feel like that we're, and maybe I'm just maybe I'm just being a, a, a being ridiculous, but I feel like we're on the verge of 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 losing rights in the name of civility, and and like which is a decent thing, civility. But I I also feel like that um, you know the wrong people can also use these 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 notions, right? Like and. And I feel like it's kind of getting pushed a little far. I don't know. Do you mm. do you feel like censorship in this country currently is is going too far? Do you feel like that there is a there is sort of a, a march on what you can and cannot say? Mm. I made up my mind on this subject a long time ago. Here's how I choose to live my life, and I'm going to live my life this way, regardless of what country I'm in, and regardless of who's president, who's on the Supreme Court, and who's in Congress. I'm going to say whatever I want to say. I'm gonna live my life however I want to live. If the exercising of my natural rights as a person, as a man, puts me in conflict with a government, then that government is necessarily evil and I will challenge it and I will fight it with everything that I am. Fortunately, America has not become that evil because I feel that I can live a comfortable life as a man saying and doing as I please 
um, without serious restriction. Um, do you think that uh, that uh, that the uh, United States is is just intris intris intrinsically racist? Do you think that it's the uh, that uh, the people on the streets right now? Do you think that uh, they have a right to be out there? The BLM? Do you think that they're they, um, I mean, not that they don't have a right, but like, do you think that their cause is right? Do you think that we should be uh, this outraged uh, about racism in this country to the level they're definitely we're... they're definitely frustrated mm -hmm. and they're definitely upset, but they are also definitely misinformed. <laughs> okay, a and why? Um, because they're not seeing the full picture. People projected racism onto George Floyd and Derek Chauvin before we even knew what had happened. We simply heard the words white officer, black suspect, and our mind filled in the rest. A lot of times when we are talking about racism, we're not actually even dealing with what's happening now. Generally what happens is this, something happens in the world someone becomes president and that someone looks a certain way and people begin to say things about that person like this is not my president and some people might say well the reason you're saying that is because he's a certain color but in reality um, that is not the ghost of my racism that's actually your racism that you're projecting onto me because there are a myriad of reasons to say that a president is not yours they were saying the same thing about George Bush because they didn't like his policies. So a lot of the times when we're wrestling with racism, we're really just fighting with the racism that's being reflected right back in our face that we're projecting into the world. I think that America has racist people in it. Um, of course, there are people in this country who, um, if they could, they would flip a switch and make all the black people disappear. I'm thoroughly convinced that these people exist. Fortunately, there's no switch to flip to get rid of all black people. So I don't think I'm in any serious danger of just going poof yeah. at any moment. Any man that wants to take me down is going to have to challenge me. And if a man challenges me and takes my life, um, then he is worthy of that prize. But um, I don't feel that any of my enemies in that way um, have a method of getting to me. But even if they did, they'd have to fight me first. And I'm prepared to fight my enemies. Do you, do you think it's... Do you think it's strange how many white people are telling how telling black people how racist white people are? Do you, do you find that strange or odd? Like like our our um like the book right now that everyone's fawning over is White Fragility, which is written by a white woman. I mean, this is I don't know how how do you feel about white people dictating? what it is how you should be feeling i mean that's how it comes off to me it's like mm. when when i when i see white people screaming at black cops white women in particular but nothing against white women love white women uh it's you know you have they're screaming at black cops telling them they're racist i mean mm. how does that make you feel as, as a black man yeah i feel that these people are definitely motivated um, they're definitely passionate. And for some of them, their hearts are definitely in the right place, but they are definitely misinformed if they feel they can lecture me on racism. But I think the reason why so many individuals feel that they can lecture people about racism is because racism has become a part of the background noise in America. Even if you're not a racist, you have racism in you. You know what it looks like. I mean, even if you're not racist, if an act of racism occurred in front of you, you would see it because you know what it looks like. And the reason you know what it looks like is because you have it in you. You've experienced it, you've heard about it, you've read about it, and that's all of us. We have this in us. And I feel that if you are a white person and you feel you have something to say to a black person about slavery, um, by all means, um, you should open your mouth and you should be able to say um, whatever you want to say. I don't think that because a person is white or black, they are disqualified from expressing their opinion. Um, actually, I think it would be interesting to hear white people talk about race. And I mean, because we don't really get that perspective because generally it's assumed that um, 
white people don't know anything about race, but I don't think that that's true. I grew up with whites um, who recognized acts of racism that were perpetrated against me when I didn't even recognize it. I remember I was riding with a buddy once and he was like, man, that cop stopped you because you're black. I was like, bro, you tripping. There's no way he did that, but this was his neighborhood. And he was like, no, I know that cop. He stopped you because you're black. Um, he doesn't stop anybody. He's here all the time. He stopped you because you're black. And he's a white guy and he called, I didn't notice. I was like, I thought he was a friendly cop, but so people, even if they're not black, um, they can definitely give their opinion. I think to say to a person that because you're white or because you look a certain way, you can't imagine what it would feel like to be penalized or to have something held against you that was outside of your control. I think we are underestimating the imagination of human beings. I can imagine what it's like to be a seahorse at the bottom of the ocean, right? And I think that imagining how to, what a seahorse and what a life, what the life of a seahorse is like, I think that's a lot more difficult than for you to imagine what life is for me as a black man. Hmm. Wow. Um, well, I mean, it's uh, it, it just always it, it just it just threw me off this whole that that white fragility, this white fragility thing, which, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like there's some truth to these things, right? There's truth to these these movements, right? Like there's truth within them, but I feel like a lot of it just gets sort of blown out of proportion. Um, you know, like there, there's truth to the fact that there are, there is, it is true that there are racists in this country, but is racism what's the key component that is causing so much suffrage in this country? Um, I don't know. I mean, is- No, I'd, I'd say the plight I'm gonna say this, the reason why, this is something that we don't talk about. This is probably something you've probably never heard in your circles because I don't think that people who look like you, I'm not sure, I'm not saying I think this is the way it should be, but I'm saying I don't think that people who look like you- Oh, thanks for that follow, um, Wait. Are necessarily in these um, conversations. And um, what I'm talking about is this, there was a period of time after slavery in America where blacks did quite well. In fact, there is a black middle class. 36% of black people in America are in the middle class. Generally, when we think about black people, we just think about a bunch of poor people. But as I mentioned before, 36% of black Americans are in the middle class. 3% of black Americans are at the upper uh, middle class. So oh wait, it's actually 7% upper middle class and 3% in the upper class. So you do have a lot of wealth variation between blacks in America. Not all black people in America are upset with the food they're eating. You have some middle class blacks who are very satisfied. You have some wealthy upper class blacks who are doing quite well and they're living quite good <laughs> in America. But this isn't the general perception we get of blacks. Generally, the general perception we get of blacks is that they're poor and they feel that the reason they're poor is because of white people. There is a massive amount of poor black people in America, but this is something that, as I mentioned before, you've probably never been told. A lot of black people in America are poor now because their parents were bad managers of their money, their time, and their sexual function. A lot of black individuals have parents who spent their teenage years, their 20s and their 30s drinking, having a great time, you know, and they gave no thought to the future. They did not invest. Um, they did not um, purchase. They did not save. Um, they lived and they drank and they smoked and they had a very, very, very good time. And now when their children are born, they have very little to show them. So you have a lot of black individuals who are angry because they have nothing and you ought to be angry if you have nothing but sometimes the reason you have nothing is not because white people have so much sometimes the reason you have nothing is because your parents failed you hmm. i mean what you're saying right now is sort of sacrilegious in some circles um you know like uh to to talk disparagingly about black people you being a black person um, what you're suggesting is that it's it's black people's fault. 
Um, for some, some. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, there, there are cases where mm -hmm. individuals do simply because of the way that they looked were denied opportunities, bank loans, mm -hmm. moving into certain areas. This definitely plays a role. Yeah. But I think we would be disingenuous if we would say that there are no black people in America who are responsible for their destiny. Mm -hmm. If we're going to say that all the poor blacks in America are poor because of white people, then we have to also be willing to say that all the rich black people are rich because of black people, but I don't think because of white people, but I don't think that that's true. The problem is when you assign another person responsibility for your failures, they can also claim responsibility for your successes. If white people are the reason you failed, then we have to also be the reason why you succeeded. And I don't think that we're doing black people justice by saying that the only reason why some black people are getting ahead is because white people have allowed them. I think that there are a lot of black people who put up with racism, despite the challenges that some white people put in their way, they rose up, they challenged those enemies and they fought them successfully. Whites resisted them all the way up to the top, but they kept going anyway and they succeeded. And we let those black people down when we put whites in charge of their destiny. Yeah. And we let ourselves down when we do the same thing. And, and I think that that's sort of related into how, you know, how, how white people are, are setting the standards for what racism is um, in, in some cases. How um, maybe I'm not explaining myself correctly in, in putting this together, but um, Go ahead, I get, what's well, in your heart? No, Just, because, you say what's in your because heart. I'm just trying to think of how this was linked together, and mm -hmm. now I don't. Now I now it's not there, so we will just move on. Uh, okay. But but no, like I, I do I, I do think that uh, you're hitting on something that's very interesting about the 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 role of an individual, and when you mm -hmm. put put race aside, and if you if you look outside this the scope that. I'm not being held down by anyone but myself. Um, I think that uh, I think that's kind of that kind of resonates with what your message is. Is that correct? Even if you're being held, the, the idea is not that other people can hold you down. There are definitely people in this country, some of them black, who are being held down by others. Mm -hmm. The idea is that even if you are being held down. You can stand up and you can challenge and defeat the person who's holding you against your will. Something we forget, Black Americans come from a very strong people. We are the inheritors of a set of genetics that survived Middle Passage. Massive numbers of Blacks were simply crowded into floating boxes that were the size. I mean, we're talking about compartments. Um, that were very narrow and very short, carrying dozens of people across the ocean. And my ancestors survived that. And not only did they survive that, that when they got to where they were going, they endured decades and decades and decades of chattel slavery. But then even after that, they had not lost their humanity to such a point to where they couldn't get it back within a single generation. And I take pride and those ancestors. And I do not look down on myself as weak. I do not look at my ancestors as being weak. Um, you're talking about a group of people whose primary reason for being brought into North America was the fact that they had a genetic advantage against Europeans. Let's talk about Duffy negativity. Um, the Duffy receptors in your red blood cells is the reason why individuals get malaria. The malaria, a virus, docks onto your red blood cells by means of the Duffy receptors. So when Europeans were coming to North America and settling, massive amounts of them were dying because they were getting sick. There are even records in the journal of Christopher Columbus that indicates that when he sailed in 1493, he and his men who had symptoms of malaria, but they noticed that when they brought the Africans over, they were not dying in the same numbers and come to find out genetically that is something that sets Africans apart. They have Duffy negativity. And that's why when you look at the cross section of North America where slavery was concentrated, okay, most of the slaves went to North America, excuse me, South America, over 90% of them went to South America. 
But when you look at the highest point where um, Blacks were used primarily as chattel slaves, generally across the Southern United States, this coincides with what we call the malarial belt. And this represents the highest uh, latitude that the mosquito that carries the Plasmodium vivax um, virus can travel. So that's why Blacks historically have been focused in that, in that zone because that's where they were most effective. They were in that critical zone where that mosquito that carried malaria was most active, but because they had Duffy negativity and Europeans did not, they had a higher immunity to malaria. Mm. So that's an example of Africans having a real genetic advantage over the European peers, but how in a way, in a very strange, odd way that that genetic advantage was used against them mm -hmm. because it turned them into a labor force. But again, um, I don't look down on the time that my ancestors spent because they survived their years of being prisoners of war. And then when I look at my father's side of the family, a very proud people of Haiti who simply said, we're not waiting for white people to set us free. We're gonna fight right now. See, I'm not gonna be your slave. You're either going to kill me or you're gonna leave me alone. One or the other, I'm either going to walk out of here free today or I'm going to be a dead man today. And that is what echoes in my veins. Mm -hmm. Those are the ancestors in my blood. And those are the ancestors that tell me that I can fight and win over my enemies. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I love that, man. I, and um, and uh, I have that. Uh, <laughs> you were saying that you ha that you like to frustrate your enemies and I have that same sort of instinct. I have that same sort of rebellious nature to sort of uh, walk against what you know what what what's being presented and and uh, and I do attribute a lot of that to my mom's side of the family because they marched with Cesar Chavez back in the in back in the '60s when uh, when when Mexicans were fight not just Mexicans Latinos in general were fighting for their rights as 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 farmers as, as uh, out there in the fields as, as being treated like human beings it, that that sort of discourse runs in my veins and i, I fucking it, it bothers me when i see uh, that sort of weakness and uh weak <laughs> weak and it you know I, I have my own weaknesses and and i can i'm not just going to sit here and be like i, I you know i, I it's some of these things that i dislike i see in myself and those are the things that I, I really do try to change, um, and that's what I. What's really interesting about how you uh, focus kind of on the individual, and and instead of sort of looking at it, the I guess the altruistic view of of some circles, but more of the individual, uh, uh, where you 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 make a stand, you 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 you, you fucking you, you get your shit together, you, mm -hmm. you get sober, you. You, you're fat, lose weight, you know, like you don't like the way you talk, change it, read a book, you know, like, like mm. taking on these responsibilities, building yourself up. And by doing that, you're inspiring those around you to do the same. And I've seen this, I've seen this personally, and I'm not saying I'm shit. I, I'm just saying that I, I used to be 350 pounds in high school. I've lost the weight. I used to be a raging alcoholic. I stopped drinking. And, and with all these things that I was able to overcome, uh, what came with it was this, this really unique thing where I was inspiring people, and I wasn't even trying to inspire people, mm -hmm. I, and, and inspiring myself with that, too, because I'm like, oh, my God, if I can lose 300 pounds or more like 120 or whatever, if I can lose all that weight, I can, I can do anything. And yeah, see, that's, that's the language that reverberates in my spine. Mm -hmm. Get good, mm -hmm. get good. You have the legacy of people who have survived horrible things mm -hmm. and they came out of it. Your grandmother, your great, great grandmothers, these are people who had to give birth to children in a world without anesthetic. You mean to tell me that your great, 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 great grandmother can push a human being into the world and look death in the face, but you can't get your ass up off the couch <laughs> and do some push ups? What exactly are you saying to yourself? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, and it is a big disrespectful, uh, big self disrespect to, to to just accept that, and and you know there's things about myself that I still want to change, but but the idea is to recognize it and mm. to to pinpoint it and, and to 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 run at it 
run at mm. it with fervor. You know, just just bl- <laughs> in my case, I blindly run at it, and sometimes you end up in certain situations. But you know, I I will. Because when I decide that I want to do something, when I decide that I want to, when I really decide, right? When because you really have to make that decision to to want to change. And when I really do decide to make that decision, it's like it's like a switch, mm-hmm. right? And then anything that kind of gets in the way of that sort of, it, it can have really negative results. I mean, yeah, I, it's I, di- it's difficult to flip that switch yeah. because. A, a lot of times we use the cover of that darkness when the flip is when the switch is flipped off to make excuses for why we're not the people we ought to be. Yeah. What do we do? We begin to settle for ideologies that say, I can't become a good writer. I can't become a good musician. I have to be born that way, right? Yeah. Mozart and Beethoven, and they were good because they were born that way. It's not that I was born in the darkness, <laughs> right? Right. Right, it gave birth to me. That's that's the idea that they carry, but that's not it. You are the architect. You are the you create the blueprint, but you also have to get out there, put on your hard hat, sit in that crane, and start moving material around. And that's when we hesitate. When we're at the drawing table and we're just talking about our plans, it's very easy. But when you have to put on that hard hat and get in that crane or start mixing some cement and pouring a foundation, that's where we hesitate because it's hard to change. Yeah, it's hard to change. It's easy to keep doing the same shit, the same bullshit over and over again. It was easy for me to just go buy a bottle of alcohol and not confront my own insecurities and and, and problems that I've been running away from for years and years. Um, This idea of sobriety for you, I I really... really, um, I, it's one of the things that I, I agree but disagree with you. Um, doing it sober. I mean, that to me, I've tried it. Um, not the biggest fan. I tried it for a good amount of time, too. I really did go straight edge for a long time after I quit drinking. And whereas, like, I stopped, drink, I stopped smoking weed, stopped drinking coffee, stopped eating carbohydrates. I mean, it just, like, the whole thing. I ran a gambit. Um, didn't work for me in the best way. Um, so I, I smoke weed, um, and it works for me. And it works for me in in lieu of SSRIs and, and all the things that when I talk to doctors about my issues, they want to give me. I don't want that. To me, I just feel like that is just mind on me. But it's, it's useful for some people. But this idea of sobriety, uh, where does it come from, and, and have you ever – done anything have you ever smoked weed drank taken acid anything like that so when i was a child i watched my family be sort of um devastated by drugs um i had an aunt who contracted a very lethal virus due to her drug use Um, i had other women in my family who lost themselves to alcohol I've had uh, men in my family who lost themselves to selling drugs, abusing drugs, and then doing horrible things while on said drugs. So all of my experiences with drugs in my family have been negative and devastating. And when you have someone in your family who's dealing with drug addiction, it's, it's difficult after that to conceive of moderate use or a constructive way of altering your brain chemistry that does not impact you in the long run. Your brain is a very finely tuned instrument and it gives you the right amount of things you need at the right time. When you take a drug into your system and you begin to fool around with your brain chemistry, introducing things to it that it doesn't need, suppressing things that it would often release, but it's not because you have this drug in your system who knows what sort of combinations you're going to arrive at. Now, I've heard of some people talk about, bro, I took some acid, man. And whoa, dude, I just had the most money. So it's like, okay, if if there is value in your drug use, you should have something concrete to show for your years of using it. If if there is some advantage to using a drug, Um, you should be able to point to something in your life, a tangible difference that it's made in the positive. But the moment you point to that, I want you to ask yourself, could you have accomplished the same thing without the drug? 
And probably every time the answer will be yes. So if you can accomplish it with the drug, what was it for? Hmm. No, and that, that makes sense. And, and there's other arguments, too, that I, I feel like against drug use that where it's, you know, like if you especially if coming off of drugs is like um, to go on to another drug, like like like, for instance, when I stopped drinking, I smoked weed heavily. And then I decided it's like, I don't need this. If I don't need alcohol, I don't need this. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I and I don't need weed. It's just something that it, it just helps. <laughs> it helps curb uh, just my own uh, chemistry. But um, you know, like there's there's that sense where it's like uh, their argument of well, what is it really doing for you other than taking your money? What is it doing for you if you're really trying to be sober? If you're really trying to um, achieve you know true sobriety, this is obviously not the root um so and then the, obviously the money that goes into it as well mm. is is the, that's a drain as well um so yeah. so there's so many arguments then we think about the, the the psychological not the psychological i guess we could say the philosophical mm. perspective of reality we know that it's fundamentally impossible to experience reality outside of our subjective experiences we have to rely on our subjective experience our sense organs to give us information. Our brain synthesizes this information and tries to weave a coherent narrative of what's going on around us. So even when we are sober, we never are able to do much more than that. We cannot experience the world outside of our senses. And when we take a drug into our system, our already imperfect tools for measuring the world are made even more imperfect by virtue of the drug that's introduced into our system. So we find a very interesting or paradoxical reality for some people. Some people will say that, well, since I've been taking drugs, I see the world more clearly. But in reality, when you think about what a drug does to your perception, it's quite the opposite. You're not seeing it more clearly, you're seeing it much less so. Yeah. No, and, yeah, and, and I totally agree with that. Um, but then there's the other side of things where it's like, where you do have people who have profound um, experiences that changes the course of their lives, that that changes the course of their life for good. Um, <clears throat> right now, John Hopkins Institute is doing these studies with MDMA, with psilocybin, and they're getting great results. So there is data that big ups to them. Yeah, there is data. Big that's, ups to them. Yeah, for sure, because you get these guys who are coming back from from war, you know, a war that they didn't start, and they're they come back fucked up and, and, and mentally, physically, and there's not, you know, when you look at the VA system and, and how that, I have lots of, I have <clears throat> friends who are in the, you know, in the army, in the armed service services. And, you know, so I hear things firsthand and how, how big of a nightmare it can be, you know, so when they come back from war and, and they have really nothing but these crazy SSRIs that hmm. are, to me, seem very dangerous for some people. For some people, it's helpful. Yeah. And uh, let's talk about these veterans. Yeah. Um, let's talk about these citizens on top of citizens. When I think about a person who willingly goes or who, who, who is willing to put their lives on the line for someone else um, or who takes a job for America, because that's what the military is now. It's not this noble force of volunteers who are simply intervening for the purpose of protecting the security and the social integrity of other people. The military industrial complex is its own animal now, and it seeks its own interest. So now people can have a career in the military. So although the function now of the military is not um, to enforce uh, ideology, it's really to enforce um, the imperialism of America. And I think it does that quite well. We've yet to sort of change our attitude about it. But when I think about a person who goes over and fights in another country. Let's say you're able to sell them on the idea that their rights as an American are under threat and the best way to protect them is to go and invade Iraq and capture Saddam Hussein, kill him and his sons. Let's say they took that bait and they went over there. We know that that wasn't the truth, but let's say they took that bait and they went over there and they lost their legs and they came back. I think that it's one of the biggest dishonors um, in our society, one of the ugliest things in our society is that we don't give these people every possible thing 
that they could possibly need to live as close to a comfortable life as possible because losing your legs or losing something on your body that you won't get back is massive. And someone who's responsible for that, like the United States, by telling you to go over here and fight these people, um, I think they ought to take care of you. And I don't think that they're, they're doing that. So if, if you're thinking about going and fighting in the military, consider this. You're much better off minding your own business and staying in your own country. Uh, again, these these thoughts, these ideas that you're saying uh, to some people, that would be very un-American. That's not very patriotic of you, Beast. What, what, oh, what's wrong? I with am. I am the patriot. And the reason why <laughs> is because of how I gained um, my citizenship as an American. My father made the choice yeah. that he wanted to be an American. It wasn't something that he was given by birth. Yeah. He had to grow up in a very poor country and live a very poor, meager life. But he decided, I want something better for my family. So I want to be an American. So he pushed off into the ocean in a little boat. Um, I think there were 17 people on that boat. 13 Jeez. of them died. He was one of the few that made it to America. And they didn't know what to do with him at first. So they put him in jail with you know, a lot of the other ones. Um, but he learned English and eventually he got his citizenship. He later met my mother who was a black American and they had one child. But I am the inheritor of an Americanism that was not gifted, but was sought and seized. So I feel that in a way, this makes me more American than many Americans because being American for me and my family is something we had to actually exert ourselves for. Um, it was not necessarily my father's by birthright. He had to go through a rite of passage to claim American and then to give it to his first son. Yeah, you're fucking right he did. Now, when you think about, you know, I think about my mom and how she had to come to this country. She's a, she's native Mexican. Um, but got her citizenship, and uh, she's American as shit now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fucking right. Um, you know, like, the the fact that, that you're sitting in another country, and you're just like, I don't like the way things are right now. I'm just going to go. Like, the the, 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 ball, <laughs> the balls that that takes, like, mm -hmm. the, I mean, the imagination and the, and the, and the just blind, oh my God, I mean, you're just, it's, it seems like it's the scariest thing you could think of, but I mean, people do it all the time, and, and for us to disrespect that, I, I feel that very much, I, I do, to, to disrespect it by not honoring that kind of um, uh, tenacity to, 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 to fulfill dreams of not just yourself, but of your offspring. So, yeah, it's very and I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to pass that, that legacy to my son. Yeah. But I think that th the wars that America are involved in have nothing to do with protecting Americans. Um, if we really wanted to protect Americans, well, I could think of some, some better things to do with the military budget that we're using to pay for the expenses of over 800 military bases worldwide. Yeah. I don't think that the American public necessarily benefit directly from the presence of 800 military bases. Let's just say we cut it in half down to 400 and we just use that that leftover like that escrow um, and applied it to us here maybe that would be enough to give every american a home uh, who knows or every american family a home or create some sort of program uh, who knows but I, I can think of a lot of ways to help americans war profiteering profits and benefits the wealthiest people in America, because these are the people who get their pockets filled when wars break out. Your kids, my kids, if they join the military, um, they're probably going to be infantrymen or they're going to do something on the front line. But if you're super wealthy and you want your kids to join the military, well, you can send them to West Point. They graduate as officers. So it's always going to be the poor people who inherit the expenses of war, but the profits are exclusive to those at the top. They benefit. And, you know, I guess if you're, if you're, if you take on a job in the military and you're getting, you know, a little piece of change every month, I guess that's something, but it's nothing in comparison to what you're expected to give. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, your, your life is the ultimate. <laughs> this is, you can't give anything 
greater than that, I guess I guess you could give your firstborn. <laughs> um, let me see. Uh, well, the you were kind of touching on um, um, you were kind of touching on uh, reallocating money and um, reallocating money towards maybe benefiting, you know, our our, our own country. Um, do do you think that maybe a, a UBI or something like that is something that would be a universal basic income? Um, for anybody that doesn't know what UBI is, uh, do you think that's something that should be instated? I mean, outside of the the scope of a pandemic. I mean, do you think that 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 like these crumbling communities in South Chicago or Baltimore? Do you think that there should just be tons of money dumped on them and? And, and all these resources given to them? Do you think that that is an effective way to reallocate money if we were to reallocate money from the military? Instead of realloca reallocating the money, I would rather just see a general reduction in how people are taxed mm. to compensate for the fact that we don't need as much. And I think that if you put more money into people's pockets, I mean, that in a way sort of is UBI, except it's going to be more direct. It's going to be more direct because um, if we reallocate, let's say we take half of that military budget, 700 billion, someone in chat says, I haven't checked that number, but let's just roll with that 700 billion. Let's say you take half of that, it's 350 billion. Instead of putting that into another um, program, just reduce the tax burden so that that 350 billion just sort of stays with people and they can invest it and spend it how they see fit. I mean, that's that's one potential way of addressing it. Oh, in general, I feel that people's lives are better the less contact they have to have with government bureaucracies. Hmm. Why? Because government bureaucracies are the antithesis of progress. They exist merely to slow things down, oh, oh, and they're good at that too. Why would why would why would we then why would we have why would we have that implemented if it's just there to slow things down? Well, let's talk about how our bureaucracy started. Um, of course, we get a lot of our um, legal legacy and principles from England, where we get a lot of what we have um, from England. But before you had an effective bureaucracy in England, you had the king, and the king served as a reminder that God had a place in society. So when you saw the king. The king really had to bring the presence of God into your life. If you did not believe in God, well, after you meet Edward I, I hope your mind has changed because there was definitely something about that man's disposition that demonstrated to a lot of others that he followed a different code of ethics. Perhaps what the Egyptians say um, constituted the path or the, or, the role, or the rule of those uh, who are gods themselves. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question at this point. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Can you repeat your question more directly? Um, um, what were you asking? <laughs> I guess I, I've completely forgotten what I was going to ask. Uh, Hate the Human Race is in my chat right now. And I know, and that's where I met him in your chat. And, <laughs> He said, cool guy, like, isn't he? Cool dude. I love hate. I love him. Uh, he said, you got to lay off the weed, bro. <laughs> I say, I told Hate the Human Race, I said, despite your name, and what it's encouraging others to do, you actually encourage me to do the opposite. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. He, uh, I, I like his explanation for his name is because he, there's not enough love in the world, so he hates the human race. <laughs> uh, but hey, you know, teach their own. Uh, mm. You know, I, I guess when you were talking about, uh, you, you brought up God and the idea of God a as a rule, mm -hmm. you know, as, as part of law. Do you think that we're getting away from that sort of thing? I, I, obviously we are, but do you think that we should reincorporate more God into our, into our laws? I mean, that's kind of a terrible question, but I'm, um, uh, no, uh, we shouldn't. The, the, the days of, divinely inspired monarchs and rulers are mm. definitely over. It's gone. Mm. And they're not going to be back for a long time. They're going to come back because it works and it's effective. Something traditional societies knew and something our ancestors knew and something some contemporary Englishmen know is that the only proper disposition for government is monarchy and empire. We do not live in those days anymore. Um, however, you still see those men who have that kingly disposition, 
who by virtue of their very existence demonstrate the reality of higher existence, right? You come across these figures like Gandhi, mm. like Martin Luther King, right? Like Malcolm X, there's just something about this guy. He's just very different. Cassius Clay, something very different about this guy. It's almost as if he was born in the wrong time period. If, if Muhammad Ali was born in the middle ages, he probably would be a lord of a vast domain. That sort of mindset and that sort of drive, who, who, who would he have not been able to capture and conquer on the battlefield? But alas, he, did, he was not born in that age. Right. He was born into an age where we do not conquer, we do not fight, unless it's for sport. But in general, we, sell, we settle things by voting. I say yes, well, I say no. Well, half of you are gonna be upset because no one's gonna get their way. Um, but um, we, we are definitely past that. Trying to inject God into politics now is not the way of success because people don't believe in God anymore. If you inject God into politics now, you are essentially resurrecting an extinct animal. And the thing about resurrecting an extinct animal is that, let's take the T-Rex for example, you know, when the T-Rex was alive, the world was a certain way. And the world was such that it provided what the T-Rex needed to survive. It had food, it had water, everything it needed. But if you bring the T-Rex back in 2020, a lot of that food that it relied upon is probably extinct by now. You know, the air is different, the water's different, the climate's different. Um, he may not be able to survive because this isn't his era. Now, the era that he thrived in might come back later. Maybe the world will return to a similar condition that was present during the Jurassic period. But for right now, this is not the age of dinosaurs. And likewise, this is not the age of kings. This is not the age where we exalt poets and philosophers and warriors to lead us. Um, that age, sadly, is gone. But for men like myself who have that aristocratic soul and that disposition that simply will not bow down and yield to ineffective bureaucratic decision-making processes, our existence is one of a holding pattern. We merely have to wait, hold out until those days of kings return. What, what do you think will bring the age of kings back? What do you think that would be the, the thing that sets that course in action? In a way, we already are sort of obsessed with the idea of kings, but we're only really able to explore that in our fiction, mm. right? Yeah. We, we all loved um, the democratically elected president of the rings, right? Mm. Remember that movie, um, Return of the Democratically Elected Representative? <laughs> oh, wait a second, that's not what it was called. It was called The Return of the King. Yeah. See, we have this love affair with the idea of a man simply by virtue of his birth and disposition merely being chosen by whatever, God, nature, um, divine right, whatever you wanna call it, but simply being born, created for the purpose of administering the mechanism of a great society. Um, we're sort of enamored with that idea. We don't really take it seriously, but we love to play with it in our video games and our TV shows and our movies. We love the idea. Um, but we don't have the tools to bring it about because like I said, we don't believe in God. So one of the first things that would have to happen is we would have to experience perhaps a global catastrophe or a local catastrophe that reinvigorated people's reliance and dependence on things that are immaterial. We live entirely material lives now, right? Your life is determined by your material possessions. Your existence doesn't extend to anything immaterial. The only people who are talking about things that are immaterial are those crazy guys reading tarot cards, right? Or those fanatical Christians in church talking about heaven and stuff. For most people, no, I only believe in things that I can see, I can touch. I mean, that's most of us, right? Mm -hmm. It's just reality and there's nothing else. We are very different from the traditional world because that was the foundation of their world, the immaterial not the material. But um, yeah, I love talking about this particular topic, um, but I, I'll give you a chance to respond and maybe give me a follow-up question. Well, no, I, I, um, I, I like your, well, this idea of God um, and um, you, 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 you refer to the Bible a lot and mm. you, ref, you know, um, 
But you also refer, I mean, the Bible's on your desk. Is it on your desk currently? Is it, is it next uh, to you today? Not at this moment. Oh, okay. Uh, I, was, I had to move some things around in my office. But generally, it's it's the King James Bible. Right. It's Haga Cure. It's the complete works of William Shakespeare. And it's the English um, Anthology of Literature, Volumes 1 and 2. Norton Anthology of English Literature, Volumes 1 and 2. That sort of, that just stay on my desk because I'm in them a lot. Reading old poetry and old writings and um, reading other things. Well, it, you know, like people write off the Bible. People write off the idea of God, and, and and I did at one time. I came up in a Catholic school, and it was kind of a kind of a bad education, and um, it kind of turned me off in a big way to Catholicism and mm. and um, in religion in, in general, and the idea of God, and and then you start reading about how religion tears people apart, creates war, creates you know a, religion can create hatred i mean like to me that just seemed so terrible in, in my book but over the years i've softened and, and and the idea of god has reappeared in my life in this sort of abstract what kind of way and um because i i, I like to think of my mind as myself as a logical person who sort of sees that you know like you're saying is if i don't see it it doesn't exist but I know that that's not true just by the idea that science exists because there are all kinds of things that are floating around us right now that mm. we can't see, like Wi-Fi signals and germs and all kinds of stuff. Um, so I know that, that, that that's not, you know, like there's more to this than what we can see with our own eye. Um, and then when you look at science and when you look at when, when they're breaking down an atom, for example, they can only break it down to a certain size, and then and then and then when you think about like uh, um, atoms flashing in and out of existence and and wavelengths, mm -hmm. there comes this point where it's like scientists get to this point where it's it, it I don't know it's magic it it's magic you know I mean like they they you get to this point with science where science no longer can explain what's going on and and our understanding into... runs out exactly and the hope is that the longer we stay in this universe the further our understanding will go right. but i think that our understanding of the universe is definitely finite mm -hmm. there's only so much we're going to be able to gather during the time that we are alive as a species and i think that in order to gather everything about the the universe we would have to be around a lot longer than how long we're going to be around. Right. Well, it, it's just, for me, the idea of God exists in that idea of, of what we don't know and, and, and the universe and how expansive it is and how we can't... Is God real to you? God is real to me in a sense that it's... Uh, that um, That's a good question, actually, because I, I guess I haven't really thought about it in the sense of what real is. I mean... Whatever Catholic Christianity, whatever they were trying to sell me with their white Jesus shit, no, mm -hmm. no, no, no. But what I do see is something that's bigger than me that I can't explain that that does exist, and it's neither it's neither good or evil or or both. It is both, or you know what I mean. It's just there's something that I don't understand, and 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 that I'm okay with labeling God, and that's sort of my. <laughs> I like your face, the face you're making right now. <laughs> like, please. I mean, I don't know. It's does that make sense to you? What I'm, I'm what I'm trying to convey, the, my vision of what God is. I I, I don't. I, I, I think what you're saying is you recognize that there's something. Yes. There's a collection of knowledge that exists in the universe that you are not aware of. Yeah. And you're saying that by virtue of the existence of this knowledge that you're not aware of and you can't explain. God is real, yeah, because well, there's this knowledge you don't know. In a sense, yes, yeah, is it, whatever real is in this case, I guess. So my question would be this: mm -hmm. um, What if you later found out those things that you don't know now? Would you still believe in God? Uh, I, I mean, would God still be real? I I guess not by the by the by by how I'm coming to the conclusion i suppose if i knew every last thing there was that i didn't know then i guess that would make me god in my so head so walk with me so walk with me on this sure and i'm i'm just i'm thinking out loud here Please. so so just walk with me on this maybe then 
maybe then this, maybe since in reality, God only represents the things that you currently do not understand and know, and the acquisition of that knowledge would make you complete and no longer dependent on God to exist to explain them, then maybe what God actually is, is a representation of you at your greatest potential, complete in knowledge and ability. And, um, and I think that's sort of where it was going, because in my head, when I look at the Bible, and so I don't, because to me, there's a lot of fairy tales in there, a lot of stuff that I just, it's just like, okay, you know, it's magic things, people walking on water and stuff like that. Um, but but if you look at it through the lens of replacing, you know, the idea of God with yourself and building upon those teachings as, as yourself and, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and looking at yourself as a God and treating yourself with respect mm-hmm. and not... You know, and, and using those same tenets and, and looking at towards yourself and obviously in how to treat others, I mean, it, it makes it more palatable for me. Um, and, what you're and, saying is kind of reminiscent. You know, you talk, it's funny you mentioned that I talk about the Bible because I'm about to do it now. Please. It's funny what you mentioned earlier because Jesus said something that was similar. He, he prayed and he, he prayed for something that's a little odd. He prayed that his disciples and his apostles, he prayed that they could become one. He wanted them to be one in union with each other. He was concerned that after he died, the apostles were going to be thrashed and scattered. And that's exactly what happened. But he wanted them to be one in their intention and their thought. But he had an interesting way of describing it. He said, may they be one just as you and I are one. So he's praying to God and he's saying that he wants his disciples to be one with each other in the same way that he is one with God. And then he says something even more miraculous after that. He says, so that ultimately we can all be in union together. So what is meant by this? Is Jesus talking about a literal oneness? Is he saying he wants his apostles to be one physically well that's not possible so there must be some sort of figurative meaning here so how can one be one with jesus and god if one cannot physically be one with them to me it represents completeness being entirely aligned with the divine will and purpose which is what jesus was jesus said he came to earth just to do the will of his father he was he completely emptied himself and filled himself with the will of his father And that's what put him in union with God. That's what completed that union. So in other words, if we empty ourselves and absorb God, whatever it is that we um, are describing as God, Mm -hmm. we can achieve that similar oneness that Jesus was speaking about um, to his apostles. Um, Give me your mind on that. That just occurred to me. Tell me how how that falls on you. Well, I mean, the, 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 the fact remains is that whether you believe in you know jesus walking on water and and all the miracles and all the magic tricks in the book there's no way that you can say that there is not ancient knowledge that exists in those pages Mm -hmm. um ancient just knowledge of of mankind from from long long ago in in that 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 spans even before the bible Mm -hmm. and so I guess how it falls on me is that, well, it's expected because it's a fucking, there's a lot of wise shit that's in that book. Like there's a lot of real, uh, um, you know, I was listening to this talk by, excuse me, Jordan Peterson. And Mm -hmm. he was talking about um, Adam and Eve. And uh, because he does this, he did this thing and you might find this interesting, actually. He did this whole series of lectures on um, the Bible and, and, and um, how it, He's extracting ancient knowledge that he discerned from the Bible. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. And he's sort of making this equation or equating sort of the story of Adam and Eve uh, to uh, the idea of chaos, that there's always a snake underneath the thin veneer of, of our realities. Because under the thin veneer of all reality is chaos. And, and, and at any time, a snake can just pop up <laughs> and just tempt you with that apple 
and, and, and you know, whatever that, that idea is, whatever, you know, whether it's sickness, illness in the family, a pandemic, you lost your job, chaos exists and it comes up at random times. And, you know, the idea is that you have to be, have the tools in place to sort of handle that and to be able to, to take the yeah. punches as they come. And, mm -hmm. and, and the Bible has a lot of interesting ways and yeah. uh, um, ideas about that. And so mm -hmm. how it re falls on me is that, yeah, there's a bunch of ancient cool shit in there. <laughs> and, and, but it just, it, but I still don't believe that, you know, there's some white dude making fish out of, you know, bread or whatever. Um, but, but I'm curious on like what your actual, if you're comfortable with talking about it, what your actual beliefs are. I mean, are you, I mean, cause you, you, you know, you, you quote from all kinds of religious and historical things. And, and so I'm just curious on where you fall on your belief of God. Certainly all religions are false without <laughs> exception. I They're all it. false. Thank you. There, there isn't a, there isn't a single religion that can substantiate its supernatural claims. Yeah not one. But to some people, based on the fact that religions are not true, they feel that well, religions have no utility, right? It's not true, therefore it's it has no use. Right. Um, but this isn't how religion works. Religion is not a tool to, uh, it's not a tool for finding truth. That's what science is for. And if you use science effectively, well, you should probably find upon, you should probably stumble upon some things that you can verify. But when we put religion in the place of science, religion fails the same way science would fail in the place of religion. So what is the purpose of a religion if it's not to establish truth? The purpose of a religion is to create a focal point of society, a rallying point where individuals who share a civilization can pull their morality, their allegories, their fables, their cultural social norms, and they can enshroud them in a structure that is resistant to change and erosion. So when you take your customs, your beliefs, which is exactly what the Bible is, the Bible is merely a book that reflects the culture and the beliefs of a particular group of people at a particular point in history. And when you look at religion as a tool of preserving that culture, it has succeeded massively. You have individuals today who are living the culture of first century Jews. Wow. I mean, it, it's, it's almost like the religion froze the culture of first century Jews, and now it's preserved and people living in 20th century, 21st century America can adopt those customs. So it, it, it serves that function. And I think it serves that function much better than it serves as a tool for determining truth. Secondly, it creates social cohesion, right? Imagine having a society in which people's morals, uh, philosophy and supernatural beliefs all converged at a single point, right? Imagine the harmony you would have. Now contrast that with a country or a group of people where there is no harmony between um, philosophy, morals, and religion, which one do you feel would be a more effective society? Right, right. Yeah, both the religion in both countries is absolutely false. But despite it being false, it's still very valuable. Mm. So um, all religions are false. Um, make no mistake, every there, there is no reason to believe that any miracle you've ever read about in any holy book ever happened. There's really no reason at all to believe in it. Um, all that matters to me is if when I read the story of Jesus, do I feel inspired? Does it make it easier for me to be the best version of myself? Does it make it easier for me to be a good father to my son? I think so. Um, does it make it easier for me to be a good husband to my wife? Yes. Does it make it easier for me to be a good person to the, to the people I share uh, Southern California with? Absolutely. And I think if it does those things for me, it doesn't really matter if it's true. It is a net good on my character. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. And, and, and that's, that's exactly why it's like, I used to have this, like, I really did have like, a, it was a negative, visceral negative reaction to religion where I, to the point where I'm just like, you know, fuck 
that, you know, and, and actively talking shit about it. But now it's come like now, you know, with age and um, with a family and you, 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 you see now that like the, there's wisdom in everything and to just shut off an entire, you know, shut an entire book off that could potentially help me. Um, just seem, doesn't seem reasonable, right? Like, why would you, why would you shut something down that could potentially help you? And so, it, it, yeah, I, I think that it, it's, <laughs> it, 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 there is definitely um, some good points to the books, and and um, there's some good things to religion, but there's also negative things, and uh, yeah, so some then, some 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 ugly things. Very ugly. But um, religion to me is art. I mean, when you when you learn when you look over the religions, the 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 creativity and the imagination that we have that's been reflected in the religions we've created, it's it's the most valuable form of art that we have because it was our first attempt at philosophy. It carries our culture. I'd say that it, it has our music in it. It contains our history. I would say if there was one part of us that if preserved would would testify the most to who we are it would be our religions because they ca they they contain everything that we have become do you uh do you, do you pray do you pray to a god do you pray to jesus no but i have been talking to my dead father hmm. almost like praying but um i'm not deliberately praying but i have um the man that raised me died Oh, in august oh so um so what i have what i have found myself doing on occasion is sitting down and having conversations with him as if he were in the room um finishing up old business you know when when thoughts of him occur and what's interesting is that it brings me peace it talking to him which really is just me talking to myself um but i knew him so well that I can predict how he would have responded if I actually said it to him. So there is some therapeutic value in this. It's almost like empty chair therapy. I'm not sure if anyone has ever gone through empty chair therapy, but empty chair therapy is literally when your therapist says, okay, here's an empty chair. <laughs> I want you to pretend that your husband, your spouse, whomever is sitting in that chair and talk to them as if they were there. And it's very effective and helping people prepare their heart to say things that are difficult. Um. Yeah, uh, Nimoy, Nimoy and Chaz say that we only have so much time in the world up to us to decide what is valuable enough for us to spend time on. For instance, right now I'm playing Pokemon, totally valuable. <laughs> Thank you, Nimoy, I appreciate your, your uh, adding to the conversation with Pokemon. But yeah, I mean, if you're happy doing that, if that gives you value, if that makes you feel like you've accomplished something, then fucking do it. Um, uh, um, Hate the Human Race wanted me to ask you about your musical past um, because we were talking before the show that you're a drummer. And um, but hate, I, said, do a little, I do a little bit on the drums. Yeah, I, I, I get down a little bit on the drums. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah. what, what's your What's your lineage? What's your training? What's your um, My background? mother gave me the gift of music when I was six years old. When I was six, my elementary school hosted a singing competition, and uh, I told my mother about it, and she reminded me. She was like, "You don't remember this." But when you were a little boy, you used to sing all the time at church. When you were at church, you sang so much that even though this was, we, we belonged to a very rigid religion. This, this was not the kind of religion where when you walked into the church, you saw people, oh, none of that. It was very serious. It was all um, academic. We didn't really have time. It was all about learning and then going out and um, teaching. That was the focus. But, she, but we did have time to sing. But she said that I would sing sometimes and they would ask me to come out. I have no recollection. My mother could have, could have been talking about a dream she had of me. I really don't even know if that's true. But I do remember that when I was six, she put me in a singing competition. And I remember standing in the mirror in her uh, bathroom and she was showing me how to do my hands like this when I was singing up on stage. And then sure enough, I went up on stage in a suit, six years old, and sang in front of my whole school. 
and they were so proud of me. And I never forgot that feeling. And I've been chasing that feeling probably ever since. Yeah. And chasing that feeling took me through um, middle school band. It took me to Rocky Mountain Vocal Jazz Camp. There was this vocal jazz camp re retreat that I attended in 1999. It was something that was, I was definitely privileged to have. I understand that other people don't have this opportunity. So I was very privileged to be invited to a mountain retreat where we had accomplished musicians and singers giving us vocal lessons for two weeks. Wow. Life-changing stuff, yeah. life-changing. I'll probably never get a chance to work with those people again. Great people, fantastic people, many such cases of fantastic people there. Um, but then I, t I didn't take up drums until my, uh, until my 20s. I just bought a drum set and started playing. And then I formed a band with a buddy of mine and we called ourselves, um, well, if I, if I say the name, people will look it up and they'll be able to find Don't out say who it. I am. So I'm, I can't say the name of Don't the band, but we had some hits. We um, had some hits. You had some hits. Yeah, we, we, we did good work together. Big ups to those guys. Oh, you I'm, know, without, and, and if any me. of those guys are watching, you probably aren't. <laughs> but um, I love you all, and I hope that you've made peace with me because I have with you. God bless. Oh, wow. That didn't sound like it ended well. Uh, <laughs> uh, which bands which bands can sometimes not end well? Um, hey, shit, what I was going to... Oh, I forgot what I was going to ask you. But uh, I'm just curious, what kind of music was it? And how far were you going? Like, when you say hits, I mean, were you talking about national recognition? Are you talking about just hits in your region? Like, what? Like how far did you take it? I can't speak about those That's things fine. without a sense of sadness. Oh, okay. And so I won't talk on them right now. Okay. But I will tell you about the type of music that we played. Please. We started off playing some very, um, like, like my, my guitar player, he had a certain musical background. Um, the music of my soul is very aggressive. It's very fast and it's very involved. The position that I had in the band was not only was I the drummer, but I was also the lead singer. Oh, yeah. And this is a very visceral position. That's tough. Anytime you're doing multiple things in a band, but we were absolutely determined not to hire people to just sing. <laughs> My, I don't, I don't like having people in the band that do nothing but sing. It causes issues somehow. So everyone in the band is playing an instrument, mm. no exceptions. Your, your application into the band is a level of mastery with an instrument. Everyone's gonna sing. Even if you're not lead vocals, you're gonna sing into the mic. <laughs> Everybody here has to sing. Everybody, no exceptions, you're singing. But you also have to play at least one instrument. Yeah. Um, you why, gotta play one instrument. Why, why? I'm just curious of what, what, what happens if you just have singers in the band that don't play instruments? Well, because if you have singers in the band that don't play instruments, it develops, it, it can potentially develop a persona in, within that person. Um, I don't necessarily have to show up to rehearsal because I'm just singing. Um, this can create a split in the band because if you don't have to sing, you're there all the time because he doesn't, you know, the singer might feel, well, I don't feel like I have to be there because I, okay, well, whatever. This can create a split in the band because now you have the band members who play instruments together forming relationships, but not necessarily in the presence of the singer. But if everyone plays an instrument, then chances are all of your rehearsals will be together uh, because you all have to play your instruments together as opposed to the singer saying, well, I, I'm ready to go anytime. I don't really need to rehearse. Mm. It, you just avoid that persona developing in that person. So really it's an act of love, giving that person an instrument to play because it keeps them grounded, keeps them humble. You still got to pull some weight. Yeah. Um, th there's a singer in the chat who's also a voice teacher who is disagreeing with you uh the voice is an instrument that person is not a musician if they don't believe in practice and i agree with that if you're a vocalist the voice is definitely an instrument um yep but it's so accessible of an instrument because everybody has a voice mm. that i don't think it's worthy of um, admission into a band right everybody has a voice and everyone can sing if you develop it and you're not tone deaf so to me, I want people who are a little bit more exceptional than that. Mm -hmm. um, I want people who play instruments um, in addition to just singing with their voice. I'm sorry, I'm not laughing. At, 
I'm not laughing at you at all, Beast. I'm, I'm laughing at because I know that what you're saying is driving. That's okay. It's driving. Um, um, sometimes, sometimes, fr- sometimes friendships can also be forged through disagreements. I, I believe sometimes those are the best ones. Some of the strongest friendships mm-hmm. have been out of disagreements. I, I have a high school friend who um, we hated each other, and like he's like still one of my best friends. <laughs> like we hate each other at school, and then all of a sudden, like you know, we have a disagreement that leads to something that we do agree on, that leads to a lot more things that we agree on, that mm-hmm. led to a lifetime friendship. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> wait, what does that even say? Oh, yeah. Um. So with your with uh uh with music, then you you did music, you did the band, and 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 then did, after the band, just you were done with music, or you just kept I, I've, playing? I've been in um several bands but since i've been here in california i haven't formed any Mm. any bands but if you are in southern california and you want to jam i'm always down oh look at that wake the beast he's 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 sending out the invite that 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 seems (laughs) a bit personal wake i mean like you you know you 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 keep a uh you know you uh you obviously you don't like saying who you are you don't want to tell your uh, what you do as an occupation which i i find refreshing because it's like who cares it's i i I mean if 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 people really want to know what i do i mean i will tell them i mean are you saying that you want to know what i do we speak english i'll i'm happy you know i mean beast if you want to if you want to if this this if you want this exclusive to be dropped on this podcast you're damn right you're damn right beast please I mean, okay. Well, well, well. I'll put it. I'll leave it to the fair-mindedness of my chat. Okay. Um, if you want me to drop drop that mixtape of what I do for a living, um, go ahead and type one into the chat. Um, we'll see how you guys feel about. I'm this. jumping in your chat right now. <laughs> okay. Okay, we got some ones. People really want to know this. They really are cared. Am I really that interested? Honestly, um, it, it's hard for me to believe. <laughs> That it's, I'm that interesting, and that this is that interesting about me. But if if you're curious, um, I will honor your curiosity um, with an explanation. Um, what I do for a living is really um, quite simple. You see, So I've been in that position for about, uh, I'm going to say 13 years, Wow! but it still feels like the first day to me, to be honest, still feels like the first day. I would have never thought, honestly, I would have never thought, like when I look at you, I don't see that. I don't see that, but but you know what? It's, 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 it's interesting, isn't it? Like, like I tell my audience all the time, I didn't even know that this position existed before I was approached to do it. Yeah. Um, I feel honored and privileged to have earned the trust of someone who sits on so many waters. Um, and I take that to heart. And um, and I wanna thank everyone here for their interest and their patience in hearing yeah. what it is I do. Yeah, well, thank you, Beast. I appreciate that, I really do. You're welcome, brother. Um, you know, with with all your, you know, with, with well, I mean, with that big revelation that you just dropped on everybody, but, yeah. you know, especially with your name and, and, and which, again, I respect the shit out of, um, I mean, you're growing. Your channel is growing. I know you say you don't look at the numbers, but I mean, y- you have to know that you're growing. And um, there, there are indicators. There are I, indicators. I can tell. I can tell that there are more. I can tell that there are more people in chat yes. because it moves faster. <laughs> the secret to let me help. Um, I just want to say something. The most valuable thing I've learned over two years of streaming is that your your Twitch chat is the lifeblood of your stream. If you want to know how a Twitch stream is faring, you diagnose it by looking at the chat. It's the lifeblood. Is it moving? Is it flowing? Are people engaged? If it is, this stream is alive. If no one is talking, it's it really doesn't matter if you have 200, 300. It's not a pop and bang in place. Right. You really want to get people engaged, which offers unique challenges when it comes to moderating Twitch chat. 
because you really just want a waterfall of text to just permanently be cascading, <laughs> but you have to moderate. Right. So it makes it a challenge at times. Well, yeah, and, and especially in your chat, it moves so fast. And like, uh, you know, like today I, I had some people like they had questions and stuff, but uh, the, the biggest thing is trying to fit in those questions between, you know, you talking and and then trying to acknowledge people for their subs and their follows <laughs> while people are yeah. talking. Because right now I'm trying to have a real conversation with somebody and then to sort of, you know, be distracted and, and be all over the place. To me, when I see people interviewing the way that I'm doing it now, I, I, I feel like it's so fucking disrespectful to the guests. But, mm. no, I mean, I try to say, because you're a streamer, you know my challenge. But yeah. for people who aren't streamers, I have to be like, hey, man, if I'm not looking right at you, and if I'm over here typing, if I'm over here doing something, it's not because I'm not listening. It's because I have to engage. <laughs> and it's, it's, it really is a challenge. But what I was getting at is you're growing, and how long do you think you can stay anonymous um, as you get – more and more popular how far do you plan on taking this good question um for as long as possible <laughs> I, I i think there might be i think you stumbled upon something powerful here i think i think you're right i think there might only be so much i can do to ultimately protect my identity but I think I can certainly protect that of my son. Oh, hell yeah. My son has no images on social media um, whatsoever. He's sort of a ghost, mm -hmm. um, a very small social circle and a very small footprint digitally. Um, if, if it happened and people found out who I was, that's okay. That's cool too. Um, I'd rather hold on to that because of the halo effect when people find out who you are and what you do, it does paint and shape how they feel about you. So that's my only concern is people finding out credentials or what I do for a living and somehow thinking that because of that, I'm somehow more qualified or less qualified. So keeping that anonymous really is, is a way to help other people keep me honest. Because if you don't know about degrees and, and X, Y, Z, um, you won't think twice to maybe call me out. But if I say I have three, not one, not two, but three PhDs from a prestigious university, well, you might hesitate, but oh snap, let me not say anything. Mm. And I think that if I were to do that, it would prevent growth in some ways. Mm. Those sorts of challenges are healthy. What's your goal? You know, what's your goal? I mean, let's say you, you are growing outside of management you know like managing your identity and such like what's your goal with all this with streaming in general yeah i mean with your channel with with, with your message what's your goal like what i mean my ultimate as it gets, my ultimate as it goal, gets bigger and bigger i'd say my ultimate goal if i had a massive amount of money um that i didn't have to pay back i would probably create an international school for boys it would be an international school for boys and the priority for admission would be fatherless boys, boys who have been made orphans by war um, and other catastrophes, boys who've been made orphans due to the ineptitude of their fathers or the lack of research performed on the part of their mothers and to the men they were choosing to make into fathers. And what this would form would be the nucleus of a new breed of international chivalry. Individuals would graduate from this university, from this school, and they would take this, what they learn, this brotherhood, this fraternity into the world. And they would be the yeast of the world, bringing forth a better eternity, uh, a better eventuality, and maybe a second sprout of growth and life. That would be my ultimate goal. I'm not sure if this stream can get me there. But what if it did, bro? That'd be amazing. That'd be if beautiful. That'd be yeah. really beautiful. You, you you share a common goal with my wife, but she she wants to do something with young women. Um, and she like, Mar like Mary Estelle, Mary Estelle was an English feminist. And she had the same idea. 
she felt that women did lag behind males in society, but she didn't blame men for it. Mm. She simply said, well, the reason why is because women don't have the same opportunities. So if we train and teach women in their own schools, they can come up to the level of men. What a noble idea and really what a noble person to put forth that idea. If only feminism today had that same spirit of not blaming other people, but simply telling girls, you can do this too. You're gonna have to work hard. You're gonna have to work as hard as a man. In some ways you might have to work harder than a man because unlike you, a man doesn't have to menstruate. He doesn't have to deal with menstrual cramps. He doesn't have to deal with the reality that if, the, if he pursues a full-time uh, major in his early 20s, that he has to perhaps balance this with the um, opportunity to, to have a child. That's a reality a lot of women have to face. Do I want to go into medical school? That's going to be a great investment of time and energy. I'd love to do it. But if I do that, I'm going to have to put off having a child for eight to 10 years. That's something that women have to contend with that maybe doesn't emerge in a man's mind. But men have to deal with something very similar. If a man wants to have a family, he also has to balance that. But the special challenge of having to weigh or time of pregnancy <laughs> with a graduation or th that's a unique challenge mm. to women. I saw my wife have to balance that. She had to, she had to balance um, the birth of my son with uh, some work that had to be done academically. And as a man, I don't think I'll ever face that dilemma. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. It took me a real. it actually took me a long time to understand what it meant to be a father and what it really, you know, what I mean, like, because, because uh, uh, when, when we got pregnant, I, uh, I wasn't in a state of wanting to have a baby. And, and, it, and now I'm so happy that I have a child and, and like the benefit outweighed totally whatever my infantile thinking was then. But but like what it really means to step up as a father and it's not just providing money in a house. It's like you have to be there and be involved and in what's expected out of your mate and what they expect out of you and how to and it took me some learning. I mean, I was mm -hmm. I was I came out of alcoholism and just being a wild musician and then here we are it's time to have a baby mm -hmm. you know what i mean now so, here we are speaking english good too <laughs> yeah exactly <sighs> I, I, attempt yeah speaking english good um but it, it, i think there is something lacking um in, in in for men these days do you do you think i mean when, when you look at you know how when you look at like middle-aged men how there's like this problem with suicide and um you know like I was saying in the beginning, toxic masculinity, where, where do you think this comes from and, and why do you think it's being implemented so hard, these, these ideas of, of uh, masculine toxic? Mm. Toxic masculinity is a red herring. Okay. Um, uh, toxic masculinity is a red herring. It, it is not the true source of toxicity, being masculine. There are two types of people in this world, people who are toxic and people who are not toxic. And your level of toxicity cannot be determined by your gender or how feminine or how masculine you are. If you are a toxic person, it has nothing to do with your sex characteristics, be they primary or secondary. It has nothing to do with your gender identity or your gender role. It is because there is a fatal flaw in your software yeah. that is impacting how you interact with others socially. You might be able to address that flaw. Um, generally, when it comes to hardware, excuse me, software flaws that are that deep, you might have to reformat um, the whole hard disk, wipe everything off, right? Maybe make a backup and then wipe everything off the drive and then reinstall the operating system. Sometimes it takes that much to get a person to come out of their toxicity. But sometimes it's not the software, is it? Sometimes that flaw is hardware related. And when it's hardware, mm, you can't just reset the hard drive, can you? You can't just make a backup and then reinstall the operating system. See, if it's hardware, you got to open it up. You got to take out the old parts. And that's really painful. 
to have parts of you removed yeah. that maybe you held on to for a while that made you feel safe and comfortable. Now someone's coming and taking them out and then they're putting other parts in. What is this? Don't put this in me. This That ain't my president, right? It hurts. Mm. But if you endure, now we can run Windows on you. Now we can run Mac OS. Now we can run iOS. Now you can be a human with the rest of us. Welcome to the club. Mm. Uh, uh. You were you were saying there was some you had some problems with feminism, especially today's feminism, because it has changed. I mean, when I was in college, feminism sort of embraced this um, all all encompassing sort of thing. They sort of were fighting for all the. It, it, it didn't just stop at women and gender. It, it, it went on, and I think I went to college during this time that sort of led to where we're at now this idea mm -hmm. that you know gender identity politics i was going into sociology mm -hmm. i was i was balls deep in that um what what is how it shifted now seems to be toxic in a way and, and i'm not trying to say that feminists are toxic but they can be it just depends i don't think I, you know i think it's just the people like you're saying a person could be toxic what do, what do you find wrong now with feminism and, and the direction it's taking this country in a lot of ways feminism succeeded we can point to substantial successes that feminism brought about women can vote yeah. Um, women have greater protection against being raped and sexually assaulted. Um, women make a lot of money <laughs> um, in society. So in a lot of ways, feminism has succeeded. Yeah. The problem is, is that feminism succeeded so well that it's now being rubbed like a magic genie bottle <laughs> where people are demanding that it do things that no ideological system can do, like guarantee you success over another person. There isn't a single ideology that can guarantee that you'll have the same success as someone else. No one can determine that. That success isn't even in the cards for all men. A lot of men fail, but some men succeed. And the thing is, maybe in the minds of some feminists, they have the idea that there's like this secret boys club and all the boys just keep the girls out. But what they don't understand is that some of these boys clubs don't even admit other boys, right? If I were to try to go to the country club where Donald Trump plays golf, I'm not allowed into that. You, they're probably not gonna allow me into that social circle. I have to be recommended by a guest, right? Mm -hmm. So even when you are male, this isn't just, uh, you don't get a membership card into all places, really what you get as a man is a lot less sympathy from society, um, a lot less understanding when you fail. And really living like a man um, isn't really all that glamorous. And I think that's why um, in all places where they can, women claim their gender. They, when they come onto the internet, women gender themselves because they want you to recognize that they are uh, a woman. I mean, really, if you wanted to be completely gender anonymous and gender fluid, the internet gives you the perfect opportunity. And what has this massive experiment of the internet demonstrated? That by and large, most people, dare I say all people, want you to know what their gender and their sex is. Even if it's not one that you understand or, or agree with, it's generally something that people want to share and let be known uh, to others. Yeah, yeah. Um so then what do you think what, what what do you think men could do i mean given the current climate and and again we're talking about where it's almost you're almost persecuted for being a man or being a manly man even to to work out to pump up you know and, and to be strong is almost looked at as as as, as not weak but it's toxic um so how do you how do you get past these how do you get past these weird social quote unquote norms that are sort of being pressed upon men these days. And, and given the information that we know that about, you know, suicide and, and, and with men and, and, you know, depression and, and mental illness, especially, mm. I mean, how do we get past this? How do you, how do you, how do you remedy this? I mean, I know that's a huge best way question. to remedy. The best way to remedy anything, is to realize what the ultimate remedy of every social malady is on this planet. 
and that's people. We are the remedy to all of the all of the maladies that afflict us socially. Um, what do you want? What should you do if you know that people are failing in a certain situation or in a particular context? You become something greater than yourself. You become the solution to that problem, and then you model the behavior that other people should exhibit to help you fix said issue. So the greatest thing a man can do, really a woman too, a women can do this. And I think that there are many women who do this every day. If you want to slow down the moral degradation and if you want to, for as long as possible, hold back the winds of the second law of thermodynamics, which states that all things are moving toward chaos, simply model the behavior that everyone else should be following, stand your ground, defend your ideas, and when you see a man who is weaker than you, do what Abraham Lincoln said, look down on him, but only with the intent of lifting him up so he can stand beside you. Yeah. Um, what, we're wrapping up here and uh, I'm just, what was your, what was the purpose of starting your, your stream? I mean, what, what were you, I mean, you know, like you, you indicate and you know, um, and you also you told us all what you did, and that was very gracious of you. And and with that, uh, you indicate you know uh, having money. So what drove you to start uh, streaming? Oh, thank you for the follow, Og, Og Nightcrawler, <laughs> OG Nightcrawler. Okay, my bad. <laughs> you you said that I indicated I had money. Yeah. Really? Do, do you think I'm wealthy? What do I don't you think? know. Well, do you think I I don't I don't know. And, but only the way you talk, you've indicated about yourself in the past. I don't have any. Okay. Uh, maybe I misheard. And maybe I'm wrong. Okay. But if you are, okay, let's just say that you are in a comfortable position with Bunny. What, um, I guess that would, that would, that would be, that, that's totally pointless to do that. What, let's just take money out of the equation. How about that? How about that? Good what, idea. What? <laughs> what? You know, I, I, I often find myself asking people, like, how much money did you make? You know, like, I, I, it's just my own silly um, way of thinking. But, hey, it's gotten me here. <laughs> um, what, what was the, why did you start? Why, why did you start doing this? If, uh, I'll, t please. I'll tell you about the day I started. Sure. Um, the day I started, I was walking outside, um, outside of my office, and I had something to say but there was no one to say it to. And so I reached in my pocket and I noticed I had this app called Twitch. I hadn't really made much use of it because I don't, and at, I'm at an age now to where video games are not particularly interesting for the long run. Like I'll start a video game and I'm like, boy, this is fun. But then like 10, 15 minutes later, I'm ready to start doing something else. But now I had something to say. So. I turned it on and I just started talking. And in the beginning, there was absolutely nobody in my room. I don't know how many hours I spent just looking at the screen, talking to no one. I guess it was excellent practice for when people finally did show up. Yeah. But then slowly, and because so, slowly but surely that's what happened. It, it got to the point to where I turned the chat off because nobody was in there. And I just sort of used, I, it was like looking into a mirror, just talking. Yeah. Um, but then someone started talking to me and I was like, oh, this, someone's in here. Um, and they asked me questions and we started talking about Thomas Hobbes and we started talking about Shakespeare. And slowly but surely, I realized that I wasn't the only one who had something to say. In fact, I wasn't the only one that wanted to say what I had to say, which was to express the reality that there was a flame inside of me that was going out. It was a flame that represented all that my ancestors were and hoped me to be. But this flame was going out because we live in a contemporary world that does not foster the sort of oxygen that this flame feeds upon. In fact, a lot of the oxygen that it needs was deprived from us. It was taken from us. Um, we never had a chance. Our fathers were convinced that that oxygen was bad. And so they didn't even give it to us. So now we have to stoke the flames of a fire that never really got off to a good start. And here we are as men having to nurse it back together. But here's what you can do. In the event that you find that there's a weak flame, 
and the wind is blowing against it, threatening to put it out, if everyone huddles around it, you can make a defense of that flame. In fact, between your powers combined, you can give enough defense to that flame to where it finally does find the oxygen it needs to grow. And now you don't have just a couple of sparks. You have a blazing inferno hot enough to smelt all of the imperfections out of you and your peers standing around. And this is the essence of brotherhood, a group of men dedicated to the idea of perpetual betterment and pursuing betterment through devotion to oneself and in service to others. And so that is the idea that I rally around. And although we do a lot of free association over on Meditations of Men, that still remains the battle flag and the coat of arms of what this is about, getting stronger together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that, that was, so did, have you ever found yourself, I mean, like, have you always sort of viewed the world the way you do? Is this something that nope. you've had to come into in, later in mm -hmm. life? Like, yeah. I mean, I'd, even, I'd say, I think that there are two versions of, uh, my adulthood mm. there was me prior to being excommunicated mm -hmm. from my family and my peers and then the me that emerged from the dead phoenix of my excommunication and i have to say that i like the warm glow of these embers more than i like the stale cold air before yeah yeah that i i I heard your story, would you tell it on your stream about you being excommunicated? I'm sure that was very painful, especially from your family and such. But out of these weird things that happen to us, not weird, awful things, um, you know, you can either submit to it and, and become, you know, small in, in the shadow of it, or you can rise above. And you obviously rose above. Um, but the fire rises, <laughs> right? Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, because, you know, there's so many things in life that happens where you're in this moment and you're like, God, why me? And then, you know, two years later, you're like, oh, that's why. That's why me. Mm. And a lot of people, a lot of people stop at why me, I think. Mm -hmm. And they don't yeah. push forward to the, oh, because of this. And yeah. um, I, it's I, one of the most meaningless questions we ask. <laughs> why me? Um, it's the only question that really doesn't need to be answered. The only question that deserves an answer is what now? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, you even saying that just ignited this crazy fire that sort of happened at, right at the beginning of this pandemic, because mm. 2020, we're going to buy a house. We're going on tour. We're, we're doing cool things with music. We're playing shows. We're gigging. We're doing all this pandemic. None of that's happening. All stops. All of it. Even and, and, and even people who have full time jobs who, who really think that they have something stable is the rugs pulled out from under them. So that's a whole nother mind trip. For me, th this is nothing new. I lose and get gigs all the time. It happens. It's just part of being a freelance artist. Um, so it, it just when this pandemic happened, it wasn't like, oh my God, why us? It was like what now what's next let's do it and, and my wife was like let's start thinking about twitch fuck yeah let's do it let's go <laughs> let's just do it go because, for it because 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 what we found is that you know you can you can sit there and wallow in your pain and or and, and in your situation but nothing the fact still remains that 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 rent's due and mm. your baby needs to eat and you need money and you need gas in your car. And it's like, what are you going to do? Just sit there and cry about yeah. it? You got to move. You got to move. And, and, and being, a, um, being a freelance artist, that's all we do is we're in constant mm -hmm. motion. And so this whole pandemic thing, is, I mean, yeah, it's scary, obviously, because, I mean, I still want to have a career in music. And, mm -hmm. but, but that was the beautiful thing about Twitch. And, and you know, we even talked about how, you know, Twitch is and, and streaming in general is sort of the It's future. the future. It's the future. So why am I so so because of this horror show that we're in now, I, a path has been revealed. And not only has a path been revealed, but the path is is flourishing for my wife, for me. I mean, it, it's it's it, it, it's incredible. It's incredible what risk what, what how fast people will back away from risk 
um, because it's just not what they know and they're not familiar mm-hmm. with. I think that you offer a lot of people sort of that push. I think that's what mm-hmm. a lot of people are coming to you is that that push to go beyond that 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 point, that stopping point, that point in our head that says, uh, you know, you can't. And I think mm-hmm. that a lot of people come to you. You know, when I'm trying to explain to my community how to even explain you, like how do we even like what kind of title do you put to you? Because you know, I could be like, he is a guitarist, singer, songwriter, blah blah blah. But it's like, wake the beast is a, a man who's very okay with being a man, and <laughs> he motivates people. Of uh, like, so. How do you how do you describe yourself? How would you describe what you do? Like how would you? How would you, I describe myself? And or put a title to yourself in what you do with your channel. I am a man <laughs> who has more free time than some people, and I choose to use that free time to stream on Twitch. In reality, that's all I really am. I love it. <laughs> uh, that that's great, man. That that's great. Uh, do you have any? Uh, we're wrapping up here. Do you have any final words you'd like to share and impart with our communities? Um, Indubitably. I'd like to say big ups to the first family. Hey, hang in there. Things are tight right now. I know it's tough, Baron, having mom and dad in the hospital facing a very ugly disease. I know perhaps right now you might even be having visions flashing before your eyes of being orphaned by your parents before you graduate high school. But hang in there. I think your dad's going to pull through. I think your mom's going to pull through. And of course, Americans are going to be just fine. Do well in school. Although your dad is super rich and you're going to be super rich too, that's going to matter one day because how you do academically is a reflection of your character. So build your character, okay? Build yourself and stay strong despite the fact that mom and dad are sick. And um, to our audiences, I will say that today might be your last day. And for a lot of people walking around today, today is their last day. And if you happen to be among one of those people whose day it is to die, I hope that if death comes today, you can look back on today as your final day and say, I am proud of how I spent my last 24 hours. If you would not be proud of how you're spending today, I hope you find the courage to change your course because this might be your last chance. Godspeed and good luck. Wake the beast, everybody. Give him a round of applause. What a fucking... Thank you so much, beast. I really appreciate it. Um, have a have a wonderful rest of your day, and um, I'll be I'll be in your chat. You'll be I'll be dropping those smart ass remarks. Uh, I look forward to a friend again. Thank you for the invitation oh. and your kindness to host me here, and to your audience. Um, we speak English good, known him for a little bit of time now. Seems like a good guy. So I think your trust and your time is well invested by watching him. So I hope everything goes well with your music. Um, I hope your family is healthy. Um, have a great week and stay strong, brother. Later, man. You too. All right. Yeah, thank you for those claps. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. See what I mean? Even if you don't agree with what he says, he just sells it. <laughs> Whatever he says, he just sells. It's awesome. Um, you know what? And and now that I think about it, I, I, I didn't get the... Did someone do the follow? Obtuse, obtuse. Thank you for for the follow. Thank you so much. Um, now that I think about it, I, 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 I had another question for him, but that's okay. All right, you know what time it is, you guys. You know, oh my gosh, you know what we got to do now. After a conversation like that, thank you so much, Mighty Mighty. Oh, let me get you. Mighty Mighty. Um, so what we're going to do now, let, let's see here. Um...